¿no? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good morning. We are well on behalf of the organizing committee. We are welcoming you to our hybrid international conference entitled At the Turn of an Era, Greekist Context of Italian Art and Material Culture, 14th, 16th centuries, uh, which will last from uh, Friday 24th to Sunday 26th November uh, 2023. Um, uh, our uh, organizing committee um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, the members of the organizing committee, Professor Michela Gazzi from the uh, University Kafoskari of Venice, Dr. Silvia Pedone from Academia del Lincei uh, di Roma, and uh, of course, uh, uh, Professor Vasilios Kukusas, uh, the director of the Hellenic Institute of uh, Byzantine and Post-Byzantine Studies in Venice. Um, our uh, first uh, speaker uh, is Dr. Anthea Androniku, uh, will, which, uh, who will uh, deliver a keynote uh, lecture uh, with the following topic, a history of contact, art in Italy and Cyprus uh, of the late Middle Ages. Uh, Dr. Anthea Androniku, the floor is yours. Open your microphone, please. And share your screen, please. Uh, please unmute. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Done? <laughs> Shall I put on mute again? Uh, um, Mr. Sandro Nico. Nico, I'm going to go to the next one. Okay. Okay. Mr. Sandro Nico, we cannot hear you. Um, um, uh, so we need to, to change um, device and uh, in that case we must proceed um, uh, we can not uh, wait um, excuse, excuse me for this inconvenience we must proceed to our first session which is entitled Italian Art in Italy and the Levant. Uh, so the, our first speaker is uh, Lenia Cuneni, Dr. Lenia Cuneni. Um, and uh, um, of the University of St. Andrews. And uh, the topic of her paper is exploring transcultural relations in a late Argento triptych. Uh, Dr. Cuneni. Okay, let me see if I have better luck than Anthony. Can you all hear me? It's fine, it's fine. Please okay. share, your share my screen. Yeah, yeah. Is that okay? Yes, fine. We cannot see your full screen. Uh, okay, let me let me let me do that then. Yes. Yes, it's fine. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Good morning. <clears throat> so, in seventeen, uh, sorry, in eighteen seventy-two, Alexander Crawford Lindsay, known as Lord Lindsay, bought a thirteenth-century triptych from the Lombardy Baldi collection in Florence. 
The tabernacle was sold as the work of an anonymous Florentine painter and was described as a Thebaid. The name Thebaid was coined in art historical literature to refer to the life of solitude embraced by saints and hermits in the desert of Thebes in Egypt. Uh, Lord Lindsay uh, was a Scottish traveler, art historian and collector. He formed a taste for early Italian painting and sculpture and he had a deep appreciation for the importance and quality of Byzantine art. In 1847, he published his sketches of the history of Christian art and in it, he included a long passage discussing the iconography of the desert scents, emphasizing the strong spirituality of the works and calling them an actual pilgrimage. The focus of my short talk today is this 13th century triptych from Lindsay's collection, which has been on loan to the National Gallery of Scotland since 1979. I have spent a long time standing in front of it in the gallery in Edinburgh, and I have always thought um, and found it uh, to be a fascinating and puzzling work, but one that has also not been researched much. The most serious attempt is a 2019 doctoral thesis by Emilia Hope Jones that presents a good attempt to contextualize the tabernacle. I will be drawing from Hope Jones's work and I hope to pose some more questions. So as you can see, it's a tabernacle triptych with a cast Romanesque art molding and a surmounting central pediment that depicts a half length figure of Christ. Fully opened, the triptych presents us with a complex narrative scene, the death of a unnamed hermit. The main panel rests upon a narrow wooden strip that includes a partial Latin inscription. The wings are shaped so that they fit under the cast um, arch molding and include scenes from the Passion of Christ and Resurrection. In 1948, Roberto Longhi attributed the triptych to the so-called Maestro di San Gaggio. And 40 years later, in 1988, Miklos Boscovitz proposed on the basis of the inscription that the Maestro di San Gaggio might be Grifo di Tancredi, an artist recorded in a document of 1295. Although this attribution has been generally accepted, it is not without its problems. Most of the scholarship so far um, on the triptych has focused mainly on issues of attribution and authorship, commenting only in passing on its unusual features and original iconography. It is in fact a work that does not sit comfortably within the defined art historical canon, and one that we cannot apply a clear label to it. It presents an interesting case study of transcultural interaction, symbiosis, and a dialogue between Eastern and Western cultures. The general consensus is that the tabernacle was painted by an Italian painter active in Tuscany towards the end of the 13th century, and the central panel uh, copies a Byzantine prototype, while its format and wings derived from Italian 13th century models. The central panel depicts a highly unusual uh, narrative, a remetical narrative, centered around the death of a hermit. The lower field is entirely occupied by a scene, uh, by a scene of lament over the death of a saint who remains anonymous. He has been traditionally identified with Saint Ephraim on the basis of later post-Byzantine uh, works similar in iconography. The rest of the panel is filled with hermits in caves um, attending to their daily tasks and others approaching uh, the funeral. We are presented with a highly compressed space here. Slopes of steep mountains guides our gaze upwards, up uh, towards the encounter with a hermit soul. It is a densely populated landscape filled with numerous buildings, figures, animals, plants, creating a wealth of iconographic detail 
that requires close attention and examination. Clearly here, the landscape is not meant to be a realistic one of a desert, but rather a mountainous place metaphorically depicted as a thriving garden to indicate not a historical reality, but the ideal eremitical place. There are in fact two iconographic motifs that indicate an Eastern practice and Byzantine elements. One is the presence of the starlight uh, scent. Stylites were hermits who lived many years on columns, but they are foreign to Western iconography. They appear though um, in Byzantine illuminated manuscripts and icons. The second Eastern element is the striking of simandron, a wooden board um, substitute for a bell used in Orthodox monasteries. In the Edipra panel, we see two monks striking a simandron to announce the departure of the hermit soul and to summon the anchorites from afar and near to the funeral. As I mentioned earlier, the predominant view in scholarship is that this central panel follows a Byzantine prototype. However, there is no extant work following this iconography in Byzantine art that securely predates this panel. This image constitutes the first instance we encounter such a narrative in Byzantine or Italian art. The iconographic motif of the funeral of a monastic saint becomes popular in, post in the post-Byzantine period, and there are a number of icons and frescoes that depict the domination of a saint, usually Saint Ephraim, surrounded by hermits who make their way to the funeral or are absorbed working in their caves. I'm showing you here two such examples that share the, the same vertical orientation and iconographic similarities with the Endipra triptych. So the Endipra tabernacle appears to be the first um, surviving image of this specific monastic funeral scene, which enjoyed great popularity in the late Byzantine and even more so in the post-Byzantine art. So how can we explain the presence of this narrative on a, on a Toscan tabernacle of the late Ducento? We have no information on its provenance or patronage, but it is certainly an expensive, expensive commission. There is a lot of gold and lapis lazuli throughout. And the narrative details and small scenes of the central panel need to be appreciated closely. There are also a number of inscriptions uh, scattered around um, the central panel on open books, uh, two of them um, including, as you can see here, uh, psalms, uh, one from the end of the mass of the dead, for, for, for the dead. Um, all of these include and invite us uh, uh, to uh, come close uh, for a kind of uh, reading and contemplation. But it is not a small work. Um, its size indicates that it was not meant for travel. Um, it would be rather heavy. It's more than uh, one meter, um, uh, both um, in width and um, height. Its central subject matter should have held a specific meaning for its patron, place, and time. From the late 10th century, there was a revival of interest across Europe in the, form in the reforming ideal of hermit life epitomized by the desert fathers who were perceived as exalted models of behavior. Perhaps we can consider this iconography in relation to the spirituality of the recently formed medicant orders and their engagement with their hermetic idea. The production of such a tabernacle in Toscany at the end of the 13th century reflects the broader interest in early monastic ideal and practices. Andrew Jodisky has written extensively on Greek and Western European interactions and the parallel histories of monasticism in Western and Byzantine traditions between the 11th and 14th centuries. The Endibra triptych may be considered an object that offers visual confirmation of these interactions and parallel movements. Within this framework, a possible avenue for exploration is a Carmelite connection. Compared to the other great medical orders, the Carmelites have received much less attention and are often, often, often largely overlooked. They were a group of Latin hermits clustered together in caves and huts to live an isolated existence on Mount Carmel. 
between 1206 and 1214, they asked Al Albert of Vercelli, the patriarch um, of, of Jerusalem then, to give them a formula vitae. Around 1238, they began to make foundations in Europe. Carmelite houses were established in Pisa before 1249, in Siena by 1261, and in Florence by 1268. By 1291, they had been driven out of the Holy Land and had become medicants with numerous houses in cities and near universities. At the end of that century, the Carmelites barely escaped suppression when the Second Council of Lyon uh, took action against new congregations. They were able, um, finally, to offer evidence of an origin prior to the decrees of 1215, but for a number of years, their fate hung in the balance. Towards the last years of the 13th century, the Carmelites began to develop historical narratives in order to help them to argue a foundation between 12, before 1215. As part of this process, they emphasize their eremitic heritage. As they make their transition from remote hermitages to urban convents in the second half of the 13th century, the memory and the links to their eremitic community of ascetics along the slopes of Mount Carmel were still strong. An image of a hermit's funeral surrounded by scenes of eremitic life potentially creates a potent image to celebrate their hermitage, um, as well as their legacy of Eastern origins. So far, I have been focusing on the central panel, but before I close, um, and in fact, this is a tendency in current scholarship, but before I close this paper, um, I think it's important to view the scene of the funeral in relation to the rest of the narrative. The iconography of the funeral celebrates the ascetic practice of anonymous hermits, their everyday life, their work, their spirituality are elevated to the sphere of the sacred. When one takes into account the scenes all around the central panel, the passion of Christ, the crucifixion, the resurrection are juxtaposed with this eremitic life and death. The scenes illustrated on the triptych's wings often a parallel to the self-sacrificing life of the desert saints. The descent into limbo brings to the fore the idea of salvation and spirituality. Um, the common practice for desert hermits to escape the world by literally penetrating the earth is clearly seen on the central panel. The cave was a place for transformation and for spiritual resurrection, the site for reenacting Christ's victory of death. We see here saintliness in the making. The hermetic practice is what makes the hermits holy. They are shown as holy people, but as also as worthy intercessors between the viewer and the blessing Christ. Now, as you may have noticed, the two parts of the tabernacle, uh, the central panel and the wings, follow different compositional formats. The wings contain separate episodes, clearly distinguished by red frames, whereas the central panel is a cont <laughs> continuous narrative. These distinctions have often been interpreted as a result of different hands. And I do think that this is rather plausible, but I would also like to offer an, addi an additional interpretation. Perhaps we can consider the central panel as a meta painting, a painting within a painting. Meta paintings often are a window into a prestigious past or recall the paradigm of Christ's life. A meta painting requires the viewer to consider the painting within the painting in its own right and in relation to the narrative around it. And it also underscores the role of the viewers outside the image by prompting them to reflect on their own position with respect to the image. The tabernacle, thus, to summarize, attests to the dialogue between Eastern and Western cultures and to the power of images to tra transmit new ideas. It presents us with a Mediterranean with per permeable blurred boundaries. It is a product of artistic and cultural interactions, but also monastic and spiritual connections. 
It makes us wonder whether the question of whether of, of, of where a specific form or iconography originated is sometimes it's sometimes not only impossible to answer, but is also not the most interesting thing to ask. I started my talk by referring to Lord Lindsay's description of these scenes as an actual pilgrimage. The wealth of narrative detail, together with the manifestation of the penetrating sounds of the Simandra, the invitation to read out loud the words inscribed on the books, the movement of the eye through the surface of the panel, and by extension, the spatial location of the steep mountain, all point to the possibility that this image was inviting contemporary audiences to participate in the experience of the hermits, to take their own virtual pilgrimage. Thank you. Thank you very much as well, uh, Dr. Puneni, uh, um, uh, for this uh, very interesting paper on the late Dugento triptych. Uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Mr. Thodoros Yosifidis, an MA student in our Department of Archaeology at the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. And um, it's to his topic is aspects of the pictorial pictorial themes of the complex of Santa Maria Novella in Florence. Uh, good morning from me, can you guys hear me? Yes, good morning. Good morning. So, thank you so much. Wait a second, I would like to, to share a screen. Here it is, full screen. Can you can you see the PowerPoint? No, not yet. No, not yet. Yeah, but you see also the yes. slides now. Uh, please make it larger. Is it okay? No. No. It's uh, the bar in um, your uh, um, right hand side. The bar. Please make now. Yes. Yeah. Now. Yes. Yes. Is it fine. okay? Yes. It's fine. Yeah. Yes. Perfect. So, good morning from me. Um, uh, my uh, um, the presentation, my presentation to this conference will have the title "Aspects of Pictorial Themes of the Complex of Santa Maria Novella." To begin with, uh, Santa Maria Novella is a monastic complex located in the heart of modern Florence. However, in the Middle Ages, its exact location was extramuros of the city. At the time, no such monumental uh, complex ex existed. A small agricultural monastic center was set around uh, the main uh, monastery chapel dedicated to Santa Maria delle Vigne. Uh, and uh, as uh, its name indicates, the main avocation of its monks was the cultivation of vines. Santa Maria delle Vigne outlasted until the first two decades of 13, the 13th century, uh, when 12 monks of uh, the Dominican order arrived from there from Bologna in 1219 and placed the monastery under their own sovereignty. Uh, in 1221, uh, under the command of Abbot Fra Giovanni da Salerno, a plan of a new church was introduced and uh, the new Santa Maria Novella, the new Santa Maria Church, Santa Maria Novella, became flesh and blood. Uh, the construction process of the complex got to the end in 1333 when the sacristy and the belfry were completed, though the inauguration of uh, the church uh, took place in 1420. Um, the major intervention to the last uh, major intervention to the monuments exterior was the uh, embellishment of the facade of the church. Responsible for this venture was Leon Battista Alberti, who, under the patronage of Giovanni Paolo Ruccellai, between the years 1458 
and 1470 designed and constructed a magnificent facade. Um, passing through the magnificent facade uh, of Alberti, the visitor reaches the interior of the church. Uh, fine oblong to elegant columns support the large uh, acute arches of the nave and separate it from the lateral and transverse ones. Um, the composition of austerity that characterizes the interior of the church breaks when a sunbeam hits the colored features, the vitro, and uh, the frescoed surfaces of the chapels, church walls, and cloisters. The earliest example of a pictorial theme that will be of concern in this uh, publication uh, will be the fresco surfaces of Capella Strocci di Mantova. The chapel is located on the eastern end of uh, the transept of the church and was constructed to function as uh, the burial chapel of uh, the Strocci family. The chapel should have been finished by the end of uh, uh, 1335. Ha however, the decoration of the interior was done under the commands of Tommaso Strocci around 15 years later. Tommaso Strocci appointed uh, Nardo di Cione, uh, di Cione uh, supervision of this venture, which started uh, in uh, 1351 and finished in uh, 1357. Uh, the main surface, the, the three main surfaces of the chapel were uh, are covered by eschatological thematic circles, such as paradise on the south wall, hell on the north, and uh, um, the last uh, adjustment on the west one. All three of them are characterized by huge numbers of uh, figures, um, uh, it's uh, one of which uh, presents unique facial features based either on the iconographic type of its scent or on uh, traits of real model or a uh, real person. Uh, in the fresco of uh, The Last Judgment, a tiny portrait of uh, uh, Dante Alighieri and other members of the Florentine elite of the 14th century uh, can be uh, detected. What is fascinating is that the creation of these portraits, it uh, was used the, um, for the creation of these uh, portraits, it was used the practice of brownish proplasm, which was really similar to the one used in the Byzantine territories of the 14th century. However, the iconographic context is absolutely of early Renaissance influences. Uh, in the framework of uh, early Renaissance, uh, Renaissance influences, Nardo di Cione uh, imagined and designed paradise and uh, mainly hell, according to details, uh, to the details of Dante's uh, uh, Divine Comedia. Despite the fact that the hell smaller episodes constitute references to Dante's work, traits such as the rocky uh, uh, scenery, the depiction of the fortified city, or the secondary details like uh, the fire zone resemble a more Eastern style ascribed to uh, uh, Byzantine and artistic traditions. Chronologically, the next example is Capellone degli Spagnoli or Spanish Chapel, which is located in the middle sector of the complex in the Green Cloister. The uh, chapel was initially commissioned for the housing of the burial chapel of uh, Bonamico Guadalotti. However, in the 16th century, it was granted to Eleonora of Toledo and uh, her courtiers and its denomination chains. All the surfaces of the interior uh, of, the, of the chapel were frescoed by a hand by the hand of uh, Andrea di Bonaiuto or Andrea uh, da Firenze uh, between the years 1365 and 1367. It's one of the vertical surfaces of the chapel presents uh, an autonomous theme in most occasions divided into smaller successive episodes such as the scenes of uh, the altar wall, passion, crucifixion, and descent to, of Christ into limbo, which create the sense of uh, narrative uh, succession. When it comes to stylistic features, the artistic ideas from the East are still present in the uh, since above, even uh, if the conception of the uh, compositions uh, is of Florentine artistic uh, environment. A great example is the scene of passion, which in which uh, uh, every single figure is carefully painted according to naturalistic norms. However, the procession lacks of realism, and the fortified Jerusalem is designed in stylistic manner closer to the so-called opposite perspective of the Byzantine uh, art, despite the attempt of more naturalistic rendering. 
On the lateral walls of the two, uh, there are two rare things depicted, uh, which are associated with the sermon of the Dominican order. Uh, it is about the allegory of the church as the path of uh, salvation and uh, on the east wall and the triumph of St. Thomas Aquinas on the west wall. The iconographic background of these scenes is far away from the Eastern ideas. However, uh, the coexistence of real elements of everyday life, such as clothing, objects, and even buildings in theological scene, can also be seen in Eastern pictorial traditions. Uh, a great paradigm from Santa Maria Novella is the depiction of the Cathedral of Florence in a um, allegorical scene, which puts the happening of the scene into a theoretical geographical context. Not far away from the Spanish chapel, just in the head of the complex, the Chostro Verde or um, Green Cloister is located. The peristyle atrium consists of smaller units separated one another uh, with arches, um, the inner walls of which bore lunette wall panels separated into two zones. Uh, the upper semicircular one and the lower rectangular one. The lunettes uh, wall panels of uh, Chiostro Verde were uh, decorated with themes of the Old Testament, uh, Testament painted on almost uh, on an almost mono monochromic greenish proplasm, hence the denomination of the cloister. The artistic, this artistic idiom is attributed to Paolo Cello, however, it finds its root in Byzantine techniques. The most emblematic um, this panel is the uh, of uh, this panel is the Genesis cycle painted between the years uh, fourteen twenty five uh, to fourteen twenty nine. Uh, 29. Uh, the upper semicircular zone depicts the creation of animals uh, on the left and the creation of Adam on the right, and below, uh, correspondingly with the upper zone, the creation of Eve on the left and the original scene on the right. All the above four episodes are arranged into two uh, um, freezes, uh, um, uh, two freezes, and each pair shares the same background, characterized by an intense tension to naturalism. What is out of this naturalistic spectrum is the geometric enough scenery of the upper scene, in which almost no effort was made for more naturalistic rendering. Even the trees are springing from the rocks without any suspicion of soil. Uh, the influential background of the scenery uh, rendering is for sure based on the parallel seen in the late Byzantine art. Furthermore, an um, interesting feature of Uccello's work is the use of a big range uh, of reddish shades, uh, with Vermillon uh, as the most dominant one, which is the complementary color of green and creates the illusion of a more pigeoned compositions with autonomous particles in them, such as the figures and the natural elements. As a result of this contradictory use of green and red, the figures are perceived more prominent and statuesque. Uh, the norms associated with uh, the artistic imprint of um, Uccello are also seen in another group of frescoes dedicated to the life of Noah. Some uh, fro frescoes of this circle are dated a bit later because they present traits of uh, further evolution. These uh, composition, uh, these compositions are not anymore arranged horizontally as friezes, since a vertical axis is introduced instead. Uccello was also a mathematician, so he combined the vertical axis um, with a system of crooked uh, lines directed uh, to one intersection point technique that resulted into in the illusion of uh, depth and volume. The, fig the figures were also distorted towards the common intersection point in order to share the illusion of naturalistic depth and space between structures and objects. All the above features compose an artistic idiom uh, interwoven with attempts of linear perspective uh, that expresses a different uh, uh, perception of human in the religious art of Florence, almost absent in the Byzantine art. When it comes to uh, perspective, the work of Masaccio in Santa Maria Novella cannot be exempt. The Holy Trinity of Masaccio, painted in uh, 1427, 27, constitutes one of the first works designed with a linear perspective in monumental dimensions, and one of the most characteristic ones of his admiring but short career, which assured him a position in the pantheon of early Renaissance. 
The work of Holy Trinity was commissioned by the Lenzi family to Masaccio, presumably to be painted above their family tomb. The composition is organized mainly in an emphasis to the vertical axis with the figures of crucified Christ, um, uh, Holy Spirit above his head, and Father uh, to be the protagonist, the ones to be seen first. The synthesis bears a soteriological meaning, which is further extended by uh, a scene of daisies uh, with uh, the figures of Holy Mother and St. John on either sides of the cross. Below the holy figures in the base of the religious hierarchy of that time, uh, there are the portraits of the donors. Domenico is depicted praying crosswise to St. John and uh, his wife to Holy Mother, creating a male-to-male -male and a female-to-female -female convention. Um, Masaccio in his uh, uh, St. Trinity introduces a system of diagonal, vertical, and horizontal imagery axes that uh, with a um, common intersecting point on the base of the cross, which if seen by a person uh, from below, creates the illusion of depth and space between the figures and the architectural structures. What makes it even naturalistic is a depiction of Holy Mother, uh, whose gaze is directed to the viewer, and her nod to the crucified Christ is like uh, an invitation for the ones below uh, to uh, believe in what they see. Stylistically, the rendering of the figures diverts, uh, diverts from the idea of proplasm and tradition of, of the East, traditions of the East. Now the color and the variety of its darker and lighter gradations dominate the compositions and lead to uh, more naturalistic results. Uh, lack of time, uh, I'm going to do a very quick mention to two more examples from Santa Maria Novella that are part of the stylistic uh, evolution of Renaissance art. However, shares absolutely no common stylistic or influential features with the Eastern art. The first uh, one is Capella Maggiore Ortonabuoni Tornabuoni Chapel, which constitutes the main altar chapel of the church. Um, its interior was painted mainly by Domenico Ghirlandaio between the years 1485 and 1490, and it can be categorized as an example of mature Renaissance art, as the frescoes stylistically and uh, pictorially indicate. Uh, the last uh, example is uh, Capella, uh, is uh, Capella di Filippo Strocci, a chapel attached to the western side of Capella Maggiore, and that uh, functioned as the and functioned as uh, the burial chapel of Filippo Strocci. Uh, the interior uh, iconographic program uh, was done by hand by the hand of Filippo Lippi between the years uh, 1485 and five, uh, 1502, almost the same period of Gilanda Estornabuoni Chapel. However, it presents early traces and uh, stylistic ideas uh, of um, mannerism. Here, uh, I present you a slide of, uh, let's say, uh, the evolution of Renaissance art uh, of, uh, from the examples of Santa Maria uh, Novella. Uh, to sum up, uh, Santa Maria Novella is an excellent example of uh, for the study of Renaissance um, art uh, evolution through its uh, still surviving examples. Even if the social, political and artistic context is um, completely Florentine, uh, some practices, techniques and pictorial themes uh, from uh, Eastern influences can be detected. However, the art of um, uh, Renaissance acquired a new ideological background and thus uh, the uh, needs uh, of human depiction in the religious art changed. The ideological idea behind the compositions of this period is not anymore the expression of spirituality, but the perception of religion with human means. Um, thus, to sum up, uh, innovative ideas were applied, such as the linear perspective and um, new painting techniques with more naturalistic results were adopted, while other, um, such as the Eastern originated proplasm, were abandoned. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, thank you, Theodoros, for your um, paper on um on uh, themes of uh, the complex of uh, Santa Maria Novella in Florence. And our next speaker comes from New Zealand. 
is Dr. Pippa Salonius, an uh, independent scholar, and uh, her paper is uh, dendrocentric messaging and uh, uh, Sylvan uh, signs, borrowing from the Book of Nature in the Byzantine Empire and Central Italy. Dr. Salonius, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, let me just try to share my screen. Uh, is that working? Yes, yeah. fine. Uh, make yeah. it bigger, yeah. please. Yeah. How about that? Yes, fine. Excellent. All right. I just want to get rid of... There we go. Because I can't see what I'm doing. Okay. Well, good morning to you. Uh, it's a good night here. <laughs> it's, it's so, um, I think it's almost 10 o'clock at night. So there we go. It's dark outside. So I, nice to see you all in the morning. So uh, let's begin. Uh, so my paper is called Dendrocentric Messaging and Sylvan Signs, Borrowing from the Book of Nature in the Byzantine Empire and Central Italy. In this paper... I look at the imagery of trees. I want to explore how arboreal imagery was used as a creative tool and conveyed knowledge in the later Middle Ages. I'll put aside the idea of a strict dichotomy between text and image, between the arts of time, that is poetry, and the arts of space, that is painting and sculpture to focus on the spatial form of narrative, the idea of placing narrative before the eyes, because seeing is believing. Oh, and I can't go forward. Let's try this, here we go. Already in about 10 BC, the Latin poet Horace provided a pithy expression for the overlapping power of poetry and the visual arts. Ut pictura poesis, as is painting, so is poetry. However, the idea of a kinship between text and image was evidently already strong in the classical tradition, where it can be traced to the Greek poet Simonides who referred to painting as silent poetry and poetry as eloquent painting. Simonides also invented the mnemonic technique known as the method of Loshi, which is key to the meaning of the arboreal images presented in this paper. Similar to later medieval imagery of the Tree of Jesse, or Saint Bonaventure's Linium Vitae. In his poetry, Simonides clusters images together to form an organic whole. That the poet appreciated arboreal metaphors is attested in his praise of Homer's parallelism using trees and timber to describe human life. The man from Chios said one thing best, as is the generation of leaves, so is the generation of men. Not quite sure why we've got a red line in there, but anyway. Simones supplements Homer's imagery of the genealogical process with his own metaphor of growth. Few men hearing this take it to heart, for in each, in each man there is hope which grows in the heart of the young. Now, while hope growing in human hearts might seem a cliche to us now, and indeed the idea of feelings or qualities planted or growing in the mind is common to Greek literature, it actually only occurs after Simonides. Homer's reference to men that grow and die like leaves in unending succession, which aligns images of arboreal growth and renewal with human kinship, dates further back in time to the second or third quarter of the seventh century BC. 
Having briefly outlined how deeply rooted plant and tree imagery is in Greek literary culture, let's move forward in time to the materialization of these arboreal ideas. The epigram inscribed on the back of the 12th century Grand Mont reliquary is noted for its creative use of tree terminology. That is, the poet employs a series of words derived from the term dendron or tree. He discards words like stauros, cross, or and xylon, wood, in favor of non-traditional vocabulary and newly invented compound words. Tree terms like this appear on a reliquary of the cross in only one other epigram of the same period. Both epigrams are attributed to Nicholas Callicles, poet and physician to the Byzantine emperor, Alexios I Komnemnos. According to its epigram, the reliquary belonged to Alexios Dukas, a grandson of Irene Dukaina and Alexios I Komnemnos. It was donated to the Abbey of Granmont by the Latin King of Jerusalem, Amalric I in 1174. Destroyed in the French Revolution, our knowledge of the reliquary comes from a 17th century description and the drawing on your screen. The reliquary was an encolpion, that is, it was made to be worn, suspended over the chest, in intimate contact with and for the protection of its owner. Made of gilded silver, the scene on its sliding lid was like that on the lid of the Prototon reliquary. It showed the crucifixion, with two angels above Christ on the cross, flanked by the Theokotokos and St. John, with the patron Alexios at the foot of the cross. The lid of the reliquary slid back to reveal the relic held within. Unlike the larger Limburg Staurotech you see here, Alexios's Encolpion did not contain additional relics housed in Lorshi at the sides of the cross. But the relics were set into a double armed cross in both reliquaries. Auger's drawing shows a double arm cruciform receptacle for the relic with the border of cabochons. When worn as an encolpion, the epitaph on the back of the reliquary lay closest to the heart of its owner. In the Middle Ages, the heart was widely perceived as the literal site of memory, understanding and imagination, and therefore as the center of verbal and textual activity. Described as the, tree part, the three part tree, Fridendria, the miracle working cross has the capacity to heal its owner who, inflamed by sickness, retreats under its branches for shade and shelter. Presented to the viewer three times as image, material evidence, and word, in the mind's eye, the cross is a living tree, but it is irrefutably present as its derivative, dead wood. As both word and tree, the cross is the locus of the triune God, for nature was perceived as the word of God materialized in the Middle Ages. Further on in the poem, Alexios's lineage is described in these same arboreal terms. Alexios descends from the beautiful tree, Calidendrias, of the Dukai. His grandmother, the Empress Irene, is the root of the tree, Rizoprenon, from which he grew. Note, that in his derivation of new words from the root 
term dendron, the poet conforms to the generative processes he is describing. Halliklas names three family members in Alexios's Calidendrias, so echoing the three-part form of the cross, Tridendria. We find a corresponding number of three family members defined along the trunk in other versions of the tree of Jesse. The painted tree in Castoria gathers members of Christ's family and, prophet with, and prophets within its branches, just as the Grand Monde reliquary clusters its images. But the reliquary is not bound by a two-dimensional ground. It references its message across three dimensions, across different media, wood and metal, text and image, so providing depth to its meaning. The use of tree metaphors to convey genealogical concepts and processes as seen in the Homer's Iliad, is combined with Simonides' idea of clustering images together to form a cohesive message in both Alexios's Encolpion and in the Tree of Jesse. The Tree of Jesse summarizes the royal genealogy of Christ according to St. Matthew's Gospel. While no visual reference to Simonides' method of Loshi exists in the earliest known version of the iconography, the wooden frames of family members along the trunk in early images of the motif suggests a mnemonic element was quickly incorporated into the schema. The motif grew to frame more members of Christ's family, prophets and narrative episodes in leaf-bound Loshi. In Urvieto, the tree of Jesse is one of four trees organizing clusters of images of the Bible on the facade of the city cathedral. It is the only extensive historiated example of its type in Western Europe but corresponds roughly to a number of large trees of Jesse painted on the walls of churches throughout Eastern Europe from the 13th century on. The Oribieto trees are all carved in relief to form a three-dimensional framework for the word of God. Here, biblical episodes surrounded by their living arboreal frames reference the book of scripture and, and the book of nature. Although the book of nature is routinely associated with Augustine, the underlying theological insights for it came via John Scottus Origina from the Greek fathers to the Latin environment. In the patristic view, knowledge of the book of nature was relevant, even necessary, to correctly understand the Bible. For its subsequent development in the Middle Ages, pride of place has conventionally been given to the Franciscan scholar Bonaventure. The fathers of the church predominantly conceptualized the book of nature in terms of the spoken word, whereas in the Middle Ages, the metaphor was increasingly presented as something that had to be seen and not only heard. Accordingly, at Orvieto, the two books are supplied in images, not words. The sculpted reliefs represent the book of scripture in content and form. Left of the main entrance portal, two trees frame episodes from the Genesis and the tree of Jesse. Here's the Genesis, here's the tree of Jesse referencing the Old Testament here. These are mirrored across the portal with stories from the New Testament and the Last Judgment. The Old and the New Testaments hinge across the doorway of the church. Presided over by Christ, 
whose image runs along the central axis of the facade as the Christ child, as the Lamb of God, the holy face, and in heaven. Looking closely at the arboreal pattern of the program, and that is reading deeper uh, into the program, the hinging effect with Christ at the center becomes even more emphatic. Reading across the trees, the rectangular vignettes surrounding the Genesis episodes at the far left mirror the re rectangular shape of those on the Last Judgment on the far right. The episodes on the two central trees, on the other hand, are contained in circular loshi defined by acanthus foliage. The shape of the arboreal frames forms a chiastic narrative structure, AB, BA, hinging on the figure of Christ repeated along the central axis. Chiastic structures are rhetorical devices that focus readers' attention on the central idea or turning point of a unit, of a unit. Their crosswise shape provides a hermeneutic key considered indispensable for the proper interpretation of biblical writings. The Orvieto trees then guide readers to new depths of meaning when confronting the forest of scripture before their eyes. In this paper, we have moved from words that evoke images to images that evoke words, from Greek and Roman poetry through patristic ideas of the Book of Nature and their reception and development in the Middle Ages, a process in which St. Bonaventure is key. The Franciscan scholar framed the Book of Nature with a strong Christological perspective, within, sorry, a strong Christological perspective. If we want to contemplate spiritual things, we need to take up the cross as if it were a book. Christ himself is this book of wisdom, Bonaventure said. And the wood of the cross, which is both Christ and book, comes from the tree. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Salionius, for your very interesting paper on these messages, the dendrocentric messages, uh, and the examples that you showed us, especially from Orvieto. And um, now we have a, a slight change in the program since um, uh, Dr. Andronico couldn't deliver her paper, and now she's on. Uh, she's go moving to airport to take her flight. Uh, so we have, um, in our program, we have a five minutes break, but I would prefer to continue um, and uh, have more time for uh, discussion. So uh, the next paper is for, from uh, Dr. Silvia Pedone from Academia Lincei of uh, Roma, but uh, due to unexpected problems, she could not uh, deliver her uh, um, her uh, papers, so um, I would. Um, she sent me her paper to read it, and uh, her paper is entitled "Wrapping uh, Writing: The Use of the Pseudo Kufic in the Figurative Art."
Um, good morning, everyone. First of all, I would like to thank my colleagues, Michele Agazzi and Pascalis Andrudis for involving me in this very rich conference. I'm sorry and I apologize if I will not be reading, reading this uh, text myself due to unexpected event related to my health. However, I hope that my research can interest the participants by postponing a possible discussion to a written exchange. The somewhat uh, cryptic title of my contribution is intended to allude uh, to the not always transparent character that writing takes on the visual arts. And yet, precisely when writing becomes opaque and even illegible, it can acquire a different form of transparency of an aesthetic kind rather than a strictly logical one. Thus, precisely such a veiling can uh, contribute to revealing something of the elusive and symbolic power of the form of writing, an uh, arcane and almost uh, runic power, I would say, which precisely as it escapes full readability becomes an attribute of many sacred images in both Byzantine and Italian art that is a veil that wraps the sense of mystery that images pre preserve. But even pseudo writing is therefore subject to a, an act of reading, albeit sui generis, and we know well that <coughs> any act of reading is actually an act of interpretation at the same time of misunderstanding, if not of misreading from which derives a continuous and precarious tension between textual structures and their meanings. <coughs> If so, the appropriation, the appropriation and reshaping of the formal structure and visual appearances of writing is a no less strong kind of mis uh, prision uh, just to adopt and to adapt uh, the term used by the American literary critic Harold Bloom. In what follows, I will focus uh, on uh, what seems to me a very interesting case of pseudoscript, that is to say the so-called pseudocufic decoration, in particular within the Italian, Byzantine, culture and artistic world, uh, which is indeed a special case of intentional misunderstanding and misprision. Uh, for it reveals not only a kind of uh, penetration and hybridization between different artistic and cultural traditions, but also, and more interestingly, a controversial and unresolved drive to initiation, symbolic appropriation, and aesthetic exorcism. Uh, in uh, other words, pseudo-Kufic ornament is also a visual strategy to come to terms with the anxiety of cultural influence, to quote Bloom again. Thus, it seems uh, promising uh, to try to sketch or outline, even if very briefly, a map of such a phenomenon. The modern history of uh, the Pseudo-Kufic begins of the mid, uh, in the mid 19th century. It begins precisely with the puzzling problem in a brief but insightful paper published on the Revue Archéologique in uh, 1846, the French archaeologist Adrien de Longperrier underlined uh, the presence in the French medieval art of some foreign ornamental features rather pertaining to the oriental cultural and artistic tradition. Although in uh, very different shapes, these particular characters are in fact widespread throughout the Mediterranean era as an effect of the pervasive influence of Islamic and entering contagion that determined the continuous presence of such motifs in artistic traditions far removed from Islamic conception of art. Uh, for example, in 14th century French works or in Renaissance Italian painting and sculpture, uh, in the decoration of trapeze borders or architectural elements, uh, where these ornamental features seem to uh, be 
immune to the rediscovery of ancient classic legacy and its deep impact on the evolution of style and taste. If we can understand the surprise of Long Perrier to find Islamic ornamental patterns merging with the mimetic principle governing the main Western pictorial tradition, the problem of artistic contamination between different pictorial systems is no less puzzling for us today. Indeed, in trying no, to explain the presence of the same features in artistic and cultural domains that had supposedly no historical context, we must face two main different options. On the one hand, an epidemiological hypothesis based on the idea of transmission and migration of materials, representations on forms from uh, one group or culture to another one, even if though ways that are no longer historically identifiable, identifiable and on the other hand, a structural hypothesis resting on the very different assumption, assumption that there, uh, there uh, may have been some kind of spontaneous and independent convergence according to some uh, formal cross-cultural universal impulse or artistic in instinct, if we prefer not to speak of stylistic laws as Gottfried Semper did uh, with regard to ornaments. However, these are hardly totally exclusive approaches and it seems more reasonable to believe that they are complementary phenomena. In any way, that is uh, what we can surely find in the case I want to deal with here. The spread of Islamic ornamental motifs in the Byzantine artistic production, taking into account that the encounter between Byzantium and Islam was made of points of uh, collusion, but also of uh, collusion, collision, but uh, also of collusion. As a matter of fact, the infection of an artistic culture by external, not endemic agent is never so inert as an extremely formalistic theory seems to believe even when the infectious element, as, is, as it were, has a harmless and natural appearance. From a visual and structural viewpoint, these ornamental motifs exploit the formal and geometric properties of Arabic Kufic script with its combination of vertical, angular, um, and horizontal segments that makes it's specifically fitting for architectural and monumental settings, but also transform the characters and so have an actually meaningless of false writing. In this way, we found in the same shape that uh, should be purely ornamental, both the elimination of sense and the remains of sense. Even if the most abstract decorative patterns and therefore more distant from the semantic dimension of writing proper, the overall structure and disposition of pseudo-Kufic ornament never completely reject the appearing or the functional appearing of a real script. We find uh, some uh, clear instances of such a choice on a monumental scale in many uh, Greek Byzantine buildings, such as in Panagia of Osius Lucas, where we can focus one intention both on the rich uh, brickwork decoration of the walls and on some fragments of the long sample of the cornices of the external eastern wall. Uh, the same motif is also taken up in the external decoration of the Middle Byzantine churches of Athens, of which you see an example here, and you can find uh, it in the representation of the buildings as shown in the beautiful page of the Minologion of uh, Basil II, illuminated by the painter Minas. Uh, although typical case in the Byzantine domain is that of the Catholicon of uh, the Daphne monastery. Uh, here the pseudo Kufic is uh, present in the frame of the presbytery, which runs below the mosaic or in uh, some marble frames preserved in the lapidary. As we can see, the recursivity moda modularity and compositionality of characters uh, together with their spatial distribution in linear freeze-like sequences make made pseudo-Kufic uh, ornament a highly adaptable decoration. 
uh, for the most uh, different settings as shown by a large number of works in different media, painting, sculpture, miniature, goldsmithing. In all these cases, we recognize the unmistakable visual likeness, albeit superficial, of uh, real calligraphy, of Islamic calligraphy. In the Italian context, this use also takes uh, on, the of, uh, on the character of a quotation and therefore of uh, a, an ideal reference to a distant East, in my opinion, strongly filtered by Greek works and artists. So we have to face uh, some uh, intriguing questions. Which is the value of the script -like likeness and how much did this um, likeness in influence uh, the preference for uh, such a decoration form, and why Byzantine artists found suitable for their purpose an alien pseudo script. If the purpose was to suggest the visual impression of a kind of writing, or at least of characters, se rapproche beaucoup pour la forme, as Longperrier put in, uh, then uh, why not to use uh, real writing as we can see in the exceptional case of uh, the famous cup of the treasury of San Marco in Venice. Um, this is a difficult question and probably several factions, factors uh, concur here. Uh, technical competence, economic pragmatic choices, aesthetic preferences, and much more. Perhaps we can speak of a combination of fascination and misreading, if not uh, of the desire to appropriate the visual effect naturalizing the mental infection of a deeper substantial influence. In order to uh, bypass the difficulties of the shortcuts of contextual interpretations, some scholars have favored an aesthetic account, if not when an extremely formalistic explanation drawing attention to the uh, term uh, terpo poetic feature to use the term shaped by Grabar of, of uh, calligraphic elements so characteristic of Arabic script and so and to the taste of the exotic allure, although more of uh, less and determinate. Others instead suppose that beyond aesthetic preferences, there might be also cultural uh, reasons of uh, more specific functional kind, like an archaeology archaizing uh, intent or a religious apotropic value. We may also think here to the visual suggestion of some ancient occult power so that the Arabic inscription may have been seen as uh, ritual formulas by the beholders, not unlike the Ephesia grammata of uh, Greek magic tradition, thus turning the exotic appeal of inesoteric charm. Again, it seems reasonable to suppose that in different circumstances, there may have been a concurrence of several factors. By and large, uh, there is also an aesthetic uh, of uh, opacity and otherness as such and pseudo-Kufic ornament was after all an opaque uh, signifier that signified alien signifier as Christopher Wood has put it and uh, so that whereas to the ignorant eye all scripts were equally opaque now some were more opaque than others we should uh, add that uh, any arbitrary set of visual marks would be equally opaque so we need an extra explanation for the choice of a sign system resembling and derived from a real writing system. It might be that the process has also psychological and perceptual causes. Independently of the meaning of the words and of the interesting uh, iconicity of single elements, the graphic structure of Arabic script could be better suitable for the geometric uh, permutations and transformations that are required to the syntactic logic of ornament. As observed by Owen Jones in the grammar of ornament, a repetition of the same motifs sequentially 
uh, ORDEC allows visual reading that composes and decomposes the single units according to different formal rhythms and rhythms. Uh, the regular but not monotonous uh, recursivity of uh, graphic elements in the essential feature of this kind of decoration, like that of similar repertories based on the stylization and uh, phytomorphic or purely geometrical elements. The alphabetic repertory could th uh, thus provide a, re a regulated pattern or a ready-made grammar uh, from which or develop a free uh, series of variations. As Cambridge uh, would have said, it is much easier to work from the cons constraints of a given scene than to start from scratch. If so, we may say that the recognizable script-like appearance of pseudo-Kufic ornaments is something like a, a residential feature. Um, or to use a most technical word, a, a skevomorph, not a completely useless scrap by a byproduct useful for uh, ancillary functions. The term, not by chance, was uh, coined in uh, 1890 by the archaeologist Henry Coley March, uh, precisely in order to analyze ancient ornamental motifs and can be applied to various types of, of uh, decorative patterns. Whether they are um, theriomorphic, rhythmomorphic, uh, or more abstractly geometric. Indeed, in this way, the concept of skevomorph might explain the whole phenomenon of the historical evolution of the ornament, which would thus be a vesti vestigial structure whose original practical functions have been lost over time without deleting the mercy of the form. The secondary function becomes primary and uh, what is accidental becomes essential. We can find here an overlap between technical, aesthetic and biological evolution. However, as we have already noted, semantic opacity is not a requirement of the ornament. Decorative facts can also be obtained by using real writings endowed with meaning and uh, for centuries it has been and so with the scriptures pure ex par excellence, the Holy Scripture, uh, just as iconicity effects can be obtained even if the meaning of <clears throat> excuse me of the the, the next does uh, not necessarily have to do with the pictorial meaning of the picture. In this context, however, a coincidence or at least an intentional semantic correlation between world and image cannot be ruled or out either. A well-known example is Lewis Carroll's um, mouse tail, which uh, is actually held to the ancient tradition of the so-called Carmina figurata and uh, anticipates the 20th uh, century fashion of calligrams made uh, famous by Apollinaire. Uh, thank you very much. Um, now, um, the next speaker is uh, Professor Chiara Poncina. Uh, from which is associate professor in the University of Verona in Dipartimento di Cultura e Civiltà. Uh, so uh, her paper is between East and West, monstrous races and infidels in the illuminations of the Cozzarelli Codex, 14th century. Okay, good morning, and okay. I'll uh, try to share my screen with you. So, here it is. Do you see it? Um, uh, just a moment. Make the change. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no problem.
Yes, fine. Okay, I'll go. I'll try to share the screen again, and you will tell me if everything is fine. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Perfecto. So, good morning again to everybody. First of all, I wish to thank the organizers for inviting me to attend. It's a privilege to be part of such a rich and multifaceted conference. So let's start. In 1261, Georgios Pachimeris observed that in the Greek Empire, the Genoese accumulated immense wealth and left the Venetians far behind them in terms of the luxury of their clothes, ornaments, and precious furnishings. The luxury and wealth evoked by the Byzantine historian is well represented by the lavish miniatures of the Cocarelli Codex, a fragmentary manuscript produced in Genoa around 1325-35. Of this codex, which contains a Latin treatise on vices and virtues, only 20 preserved in the British Library, in the Bargello Museum in Florence, and in the Museum of Art in Cleveland. The text can be dated 1324, according to the historical information mentioned in the pamphlet. The booklet on vices and virtues, followed by a verse section, was written by a member of the Cucarelli family for the moral instruction of his children. For the description of the vices, the text faithfully relies upon some very popular sources of the time, such as Guido Faba and Paul of Hungary. The exceptionality of this text lies in the exempla the author declares to have drawn from the personal memories of his grandfather, Pellegrino Cocarelli, which includes some of the great events of the history of Genoa and of the Mediterranean. From an art historical perspective, the importance of this manuscript has already been widely underlined from the pivotal survey by Otto Pecht to more recent studies by Francesca Fabri, Robert Gibbs, Anne Dunlop, and Rose Fones. Of the Cucarelli Codex display the work of a master refunctionalizing the lessons of Lombard and Tuscan art, especially concerning the details of the clothing or the composition structure, but they also reproduce the style of French miniature, as in the depiction of the trial of the Templars and the death of Philip the Fair that you can see on the screen. Moreover, some illuminations show the influence of the Sicilian art of the time of Frederick II, as it is possible to notice in the hunting scene in manuscript Egerton 3127, which has rightly been linked to the manuscript Palatinus Latinus 1071, containing Frederick II's treatise on falconry. The connection of the Cocarelli Codex to Islamic art is as well. Indeed, the features of some of our illuminations can be compared to the figurative models offered by to the decorated artifacts from Egypt and Iran, which circulate widely in the Mediterranean. This can be summarized by looking at one of the most studied illuminations of the Cocarelli manuscript, in which the rich banquet of a Mongol Khan is depicted. And for comparison, we can turn to the one in Al-Hariri's Makamat or to the one preserved in the great Mongol Shahnameh made in Tabriz at the beginning of the 13th century. In the Cocarelli Codex's illuminations, there is also no shortage of fantastic creatures. We find hybrids and monstrous races depicted in the frames surrounding the text or in the line endings. Today, I will focus on two of the leaves containing representations. I will start by examining the recto of the first folio of additional 28841, containing the margins of this page are almost entirely filled with a catalog of the animal word aimed at proposing a conventional exoticism expressed according to the rather widespread iconographical schemes of the bestiaries. This is the case for the depiction of the elephant placed in profile with a small ear open like a corolla, a large rounded eye and the tusks inclined upwards. This miniature recalls the ones which were most widespread in the European art of the Middle Ages. And you can see, of course, some examples on the screen. However, on the lower margin, we can see three figures rendered en grisaille. 
the lion is still represented according to traditional schemes as the drawing taken from Villard de Honcourt's sketch album. The bear is painted with more realistic features, which are models as well as to Persian prototypes. Also, the Bactrian camel is rendered according to the naturalism displayed in Islamic miniature, as can be seen in the image taken from the bestiary preserved at the Morgan Library. In the upper margin, however, stands a group of naked cannibals portrayed in the act of feeding on a corpse. As has already been pointed out by Francesca Manzari, it is possible that the illuminator's intention here was to depict, depict the Caspian Gates, symbolized by the fortified city depicted on the right, beyond which Alexander the Great confined the barbarian tribes, according to the well-known medieval contamination which incorporated the Jewish-Christian motif of the apocalyptic nations by the pseudo calistenes it should also be added that from the apocalypse of pseudo methodium is established according to which the people of Gog and Magog are described as cannibals and as such they are indicated, for example, in the captions of the famous Hereford Mappamundi. The cannibals, which are very much present in medieval teratology, are depicted without any indication a little farther down outside the fortification in the act of devouring human limbs. A similar depiction was also found on the Erbstof Mappamundi, which probably derives from the same model of the Hereford map and which was destroyed in 1943. Finally, the hypothesis according to which the cannibals and the fortress painted in the Coccarelli should be interpreted as a clear reference to Gog and Magog would seem to by the presence of the beasts that surround it. Many of these creatures, reptiles, elephants, lions, camels, similar to giraffes, are widely represented in medieval maps and atlases, as can be seen from the comparison with the ones painted in the Genoese Mappamundi. The second page for which I wish to propose some observations is the two recto of additional 27695, which contains the incipit of the text of the first chapter devoted to pride. The treatise follows here Guido Faba's description, which contains a reference to the fall of Lucifer, the archetypal incarnation of the first of all vices, and then narrates the story of the author's grandfather. Before examining its decorations, it is noteworthy that this folio was meant to be next to the one with the full page chapter with a remarkable depiction of the fall of the rebel angels richly illuminated on a vibrant blue background. In the upper part, conceived according to the scheme of the Last Judgment, we find the Christ blessing within the mandorla surrounded by angelic hosts. On the right, St. Michael holds the scale for psychostasia, while higher up on the side, the archangels Gabriel and Raphael also appear. The seat on the top left is empty and the fallen archangel is depicted together with the other rebels in the lower half page while he is swallowed up by the flaming jaws of the infernal beast. Returning to the figurines in the frames of folio 2 recto, we can notice that they are all dressed in an oriental fashion and are therefore to be considered as infidels. The roundels with Mongolian archers portrayed produce in the shapes and colors of the robes and in the feathered headdresses the models provided by Ilkhanid reasons on the screen. In the remaining eight roundels, not all completed, we find dark-skinned figures with turbans, perhaps Arabs or Ethiopians, and some female figures playing an instrument. The second figure from the right of the second line is dressed in red, has a large beard, long curly hair, and is wearing a cap similar to those used by Jews in the Middle Ages. In front of him stands a dog or perhaps a lamb, possibly referring to the ritual sacrifice performed by Jews and indirectly to the sacrifice of Christ. Next to this character, we find a figure with Chinese features with a small pointed head 
a red robe with a fur collar and the falcon on his hand. Types well characterized by objects and clothing definitely marks to the desire to refer to the other nationals and to those who live outside the true religion. We will now consider the miniatures on the lower margin, where a reading of the entire decoration of this page should presumably start, proceeding from the left to the right and scrolling upwards. I left these images until last because they are particularly problematic and difficult to interpret. However, I will try to propose some remarks. The first roundel on the left offers the image of a monkey dressed in a red cloak edged with ermine. One hand holds a thin scepter ending in a cross or a lily, while the other is raised in the typical gesture of the masters or of the judges. The head of the monkey is topped by a high headdress or even a pointed shape. On the right, a naked man holds a red shield and faces a green dragon. The white prayer is well known and studied. This animal often appears as a naughty and exotic drôlerie depicted in scatological attitudes to unleaven the margins of manuscripts. But this beast also symbolizes the supreme evil, which has a beginning but no end because it has no tail and therefore embodies the Diabolus, defined as Dei Simius by Tertullianus and, and St. Augustine. It is difficult to understand whether the intention here is to represent the monkey as a judge. On the screen, you have a parallel with the image of a contemporary Bolognese manuscript of canon law. Or as a king, the posture of our monkey recalls, for instance, that of the portrait of Robert of Anjou in a codex produced in Tuscany in the same years as the Cocaine. It is therefore possible that this figure should be interpreted in a negative way. In these regards, we could also against Tancred made by Peter of Eboli in his De Rebus Siculis Carmen by comparing the usurper to a crowned monkey, which is represented in the illustration of the only codex containing the poem dating back to the 12th century. Moving on to the following roundel, we recognize the same naked character from the first scene, here accompanied by a second figure, perhaps a woman. The two are engaged in what appears to be a fight against two dragons. Here too, it is hard to grasp the exact meaning of the scene, given that the second character is being beaten on the back by one of the two dragons, at the same time as the other dragon seems to embrace him or her, while wrapping its coils around the leg of the man on the right. One more almost has the impression of witnessing a metamorphosis like that of Cadmus portrayed in the Rouen Codex of the Obid Moralisé, like the one inflicted on the damned described in the 25th canto of Dante's Inferno, as you can see in the miniature of the Dante's Codex of Chantilly, or the torture inflicted on one of the female figures of Giotto's Last Judgment in the Cappella degli Scrovegni. In the last roundel, we see once more the character previously attacked or embraced by the dragon who now holds the red shield that belonged to his companion and fights against a group of storks while the dragon, possibly tamed or defeated, stands below his feet. The image seems to refer to the fight of the pygmies against the cranes, which the literature and art of the Middle Ages often confuse and exchange with storks. This literary and iconographic motif has had a wide diffusion since ancient times. If considered separately, the scenes in the three connections with iconographic motifs, both of the classical and the medieval traditions. However, we must consider that the three images are conceived as episodes of the same story as demonstrated by the recurrence of the same objects, the shield, and of the same characters. Without excluding the possibility that the hypothetical source from which our illuminator drew his inspiration may have been misinterpreted and rendered in a distorted way, I will therefore try to propose a possible interpretation. 
If we take a look at the two pages together and we consider that the full page miniature is constructed according to the model of the last judgment, which it is worth remembering also appear above the Here for Mappa Mundi, where the iconography of the beast is very, very similar to ours, but of course it's a very uh, widespread type, iconographic type of the beast. We of the beast swallowing the rebel angels is juxtaposed with the devil monkey that presides, mimicking the divine gesture of the Christ Logos over the punishments imposed on the damned by the dragons. The Gironomachy introduces the theme of the barbarian peoples and perhaps refers to their partial assimilation with Gog and Magog, sealing the condemnation of the infidels to eternal damnation. Of course, my proposal leads to more questions than answers and ultimately does not exactly explain the concatenation of the sequence. The question necessarily remains open to suggestions and further investigation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Concina, for your very interesting paper on this uh, unusual, uh, exotic and monstrous iconography and uh, all these um, 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 contacts, uh, East and West. And uh, now we're moving, uh, since uh, Dr. Mabi Angar could not uh, present uh, her paper, it was um, also on Coccarelli uh, Codex. Uh, we're moving to our next, next speaker, last speaker of this session, which is um, Dr. Margarita Bugaropoulou. Who's, uh, who is a um, junior professor and Ruhr Universität um, in uh, Germany. And uh, the topic of her paper is From uh, Venice to Crete and Back, the multiple lives of an icon from Harvard Art Museums. Good morning, everyone. I hope you can hear me and I hope you can see my uh, presentation. Uh, yes, it's fine. Good. Uh, so thank you so much for having me in this conference and for inviting me. And we can begin with the presentation. So in the deposits of the Harvard Art University Art Museums, there is an icon of the Virgin and Child with two male saints. At first glance, the icon appears to be a typical example of Cretan iconography, rather unremarkable among a multitude of similar images abounding in collections worldwide. Yet a closer inspection of the icon's front and reverse sides reveals hidden layers of the multiple lives of the artwork, providing rare insights into the commercial, artistic, and cross-confessional exchanges that were taking place in the ethnically and culturally pluralistic societies of the Venetian Stato Damar. Notably, the iconographic analysis of the painting places it at the intersection of the Latin and Byzantine traditions promoting it as one of the earliest examples of Western-influenced anti-plague imagery in Cretan art. These Western European associations are highlighted even further once we take a look at the icon's verso. The presence of an elaborate incised design on the entire back surface of the panel suggests that its wooden support originated from a reused piece of furniture, more specifically from a 15th century Italian chest. In this paper, I argue that the comparative examination of the panel's front and reverse sides allows us to glean valuable insights into the transconfessional spread of cults and the dissemination of artistic trends between Venice and its Mediterranean colonies, underscoring the mutual transfer of artworks and objects of prestige, such as icons and chests. The Harvard icon reproduces a popular iconographic model of the Hodigitria as it was developed in the icon painting workshops of 15th century Candia and associated with the work of the master painter Andreas Rizos. The icon presents a rare variation of the type where the Virgin is flanked by the miniature portraits of two male saints in the top corners, a position usually occupied by the archangels Michael and Gabriel. In our case, on the top left corner, we can identify the figure of St. John the Baptist in a gesture of intercession, typically encountered in images of the daisies. Symmetrically across St. John on the top right corner, um, 
There is a bust of another male saint depicted slightly larger in scale who can be identified with a Catholic saint, Rock of Montpellier. As the quintessential protector saint against the pestilence, Saint Rock is easily identified by his typical iconographic attributes, his pilgrim's attire, including his staff, rosary, the hat with the scallop badges, and mostly the buboes that he reveals on his thighs, that is, the source of the plague, the disease from which he suffered and was miraculously cured. Now, the rare inclusion of Saint Rock in our icon uh, and the formation of an atypical daisies together with the Virgin and St. John suggests that the icon was commissioned as an ex voto, likely intended to protect the donor and their family from an outbreak of the plague or dedicated as a token of gratitude for their recovery and healing. Among all the plague saints that were venerated throughout the Mediterranean in the late Middle Ages and the early modern period, Saint Rock, together with his counterpart, Saint Sebastian, was arguably the most popular one, especially in Venice and the territories of the Stato da Mar. The saint's popularity grew exponentially after the year 1478, when his biography was published by Francesco Diedo, and when the Scuola Grande di San Rocco was established in Venice, in the hopes of protecting the city against recurring outbreaks of the disease. A few years later, in 1485, the supposed relics of the saint were translated to Venice to be housed in the Confraternity Church of San Rocco. From that time on, the cult of San Rocco gained unprecedented popularity, while the saint's imagery kept evolving as a multitude of artworks, churches and chapels were being dedicated to his honor. From Venice and Northern Italy, the cult of San Rocco quickly spread to its overseas dominions and beyond, including the Greek-speaking provinces and islands of the Eastern Mediterranean. Churches, chapels, and altars were dedicated to the saint, primarily in port cities and islands, such as Candia, centers that were particularly vulnerable to the plague due to the transit of ships. And it is important to note here that the multi, in the multi-ethnic and multi-confessional societies of these Venetian-ruled territories, the veneration of St. Rock was not limited to the local Catholic populations, but it was often adopted by the Orthodox subjects as well, highlighting the universality of the plague that united its victims beyond ethnic, linguistic, and confessional boundaries. As a result of this interconfessional worship of St. Rock, from the early 16th century onwards, the saint started to steadily make his appearance in icons, quickly rising into one of the most frequently represented saints of the Catholic Church. In most surviving examples, St. Rock is depicted flanking the Virgin and Child, often in the company of St. Sebastian or other saints. Our icon, however, stands out from the bulk of these often mass-produced panels, not only in terms of its quality, but also because of its iconography and style. While the majority of these works date from the mid-16th century, the Harvard panel seems to be of a slightly earlier dating, in the end of the 15th or the beginning of the 16th century, making it one of the earliest Eastern icons that features San Rock. What is more, contrary to the westernized style of these devotional panels, the Harvard icon is painted according to the austere Byzantine tradition, and in particular by a highly skilled icon painter of Cretan formation and possibly origin. Although the Harvard Virgin is significant for its own sake as an anti-plague commission and a fine example of Cretan art, the panel conceals yet another equally compelling story, which is revealed once we turn the icon to expose its reverse side. Rather than a plain wooden plank, the backside of the icon is richly decorated with incised patterns that extend to the entire surface of the panel. This suggests that the wooden support for the icon was harvested from an old piece of furniture, which, as I will argue, was most likely the front of a cassone. A cassone, as we know, were large marriage chests serving to carry the dowry of the bride to her new home and were particularly popular with wealthy and upper-class Italian households. From the simple chests of the Middle Ages, after the 15th century, it became fashionable among the nobility 
to have these chests lavishly decorated with carved or painted patterns, elevating the cassone into one of the most valuable and prestigious pieces of furniture in the Italian household. The identification of the icon support as a cassone fragment can be confirmed by the presence of certain signs, namely the holes from the chest hinges, nail marks, and the vertical grid pattern that we can see in this image, but also by the content of the incised designs themselves. As we can see, the entire surface of the panel is covered with dense decorative pat patterns, leaving no space undecorated. In the center of the fragment, approximately where you can see the tag, uh, there is a large stylized tree from which sprout scrolled branches that form loops of foliage. Enclosed in these loops are various creatures, ranging from real animals to exotic and fantastical beasts, drawn from the medieval bestiary tradition. These beasts include hares, as we can see here, game birds like partridges and pheasants, or even eagles, hunting hounds, spotted exotic animals, possibly leopards or panthers, and even a wyvern, a dragon with two legs. Now, the presence of wild game and exotic animals alongside hounds and birds of prey clearly associates the motifs of the topic uh, with the topic of uh, the courtly hunt, and more specifically, with a hunt of love, Cacciamorosa, a prominent theme in medieval Romance literature and popular in matrimonial imagery. But what about the central scene? Despite the extensive damage to the designs, it is possible to recognize around the tree at least four figures dressed in Burgundian fashion court costume. On the left side, two figures extend blessings to what seems to be a pair depicted symmetrically on the right, possibly a romantic couple. It seems likely, therefore, that the scene rep represents a betrothal or a blessing of a marital union. And in this context, the tree that dominates the scene can be none other than the tree of life, a universal symbol of fertility alluding to the blooming of the marital union. The symbol is commonly encountered in courtly and nuptial imagery and is often interpreted in the broader context of the garden of love or fused with the motif of the fountain of love, both popular themes drawn from Romance literature and recurring in matrimonial iconography. The carvings on the verse of the Harvard icon are worked in shallow relief with details rendered in the pyrographic technique featuring small punched holes to decorate the garments and floral motifs. It also bears traces of pigmenting with green and red pastes, respectively used to fill the backgrounds and to enhance details. These technical characteristics are all typical of cassoni that were manufactured during the 15th century in the northeastern Italian areas of the Adige Valley, Friuli, and of course, the Veneto. Chests from these workshops were made with the same techniques as our panel and featured decorations of comparable style and subject matter. By the 16th century, however, the shape and decoration of Italian chests underwent a marked change, departing from the earlier international Gothic aesthetics and adopting more sculptural classicizing formats. This change progressively put earlier chests out of fashion. And in 1585, Giorgio Vasari was already referring to chests and other old pieces of furniture as relics. It is likely that Arcassone was also a victim of this change of fashion. And once it was no longer used by its owner, it was taken to pieces and its front panel was used to paint the icon of the Virgin. Besides accessibility, this choice might have also been dictated by the urgency of the commission, since as we saw, the icon was intended to function as a votive offering against the plague. The second use of furniture as painting supports was not uncommon in the pre-modern times, and examples can be found in both the Western European and Greek Orthodox artistic contexts. In most cases, the repurposed pieces of furniture were either undecorated or bore simple designs, 
with a few geometrical patterns or plain colors, mostly products of local folk art. In this respect, our panel appears to stand out from the norm once again. The use of a high quality, richly ornamented Italian chest as painting support for an icon seems rather unusual and likely points towards a wealthy patron and a household where such an item would eventually come out of fashion and be perceived as less valuable. To wrap this up, is it possible to combine all this information to draw more concrete conclusions regarding the authorship of the artwork and its provenance, or even the donor's origin or confessional affiliation? In the Venetian Stato Damar, where Cretan icons and Italian chests were routinely circulating between the capital and Candia, it seems equally plausible to assume that our icon was produced in either Crete or Venice. In terms of style, the icon remains well within the realm of the Byzantine Cretan tradition, without notable influences from Italian art. The artist's knowledge of basic Latin iconography, as is manifested in the rendering of St. Rock, could have been easily acquired in Candia. This, however, does not exclude the possibility that the painter was active in Venice, among many other documented painters. As for the patron, if we assume that they provided the wood for the painting, as was often customary, the Venetian association becomes even more prominent. The provenance of the wooden panel from an Italian, possibly Venetian cassone, as well as the presence of St. Rock, all point towards a Venetian connection for the icon's commissioner. And since Venetian chests were highly valued in Candia, it seems hard to imagine that such a prized possession would be discarded and scrapped only a few decades after its purchase. This seems likelier to have taken place in a wealthy Venetian household that was up to date with the new fashion trends in Italian furniture and could afford the cost of refurbishing their household property. Whether it was a wealthy Venetian residing in the capital or a member of the veneto Cretan elite class of Candia, the donor of the Harvard icon demonstrates an appreciation for Cretan icons and their reputedly wonder-working properties. Overall, our inability to determine with certainty the provenance of the icon, as well as the origin or confessional affiliation of the donor, speaks precisely to the cultural fusion and intense commercial and artistic exchanges that defined the ethnically and culturally pluralistic societies of late medieval Venice and its Mediterranean colonies. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Bulgaropoulou, for your very interesting paper um, and your topic, which combines religious and secular art. Um, I'm particularly interested in uh, this Cassone decoration. And uh, with this, um, with your paper, we ended our first session. And uh, now we're moving to the questions regarding your papers. So for the first paper of Dr. Kuneni, um, exploring transcultural relations in a late gender triptych, are there any questions, suggestions? Uh, also, people from the audience can um, ask uh, uh, via um, chat. I uh, yes, you can ask your questions. Are there any questions for the first paper? Yes, uh, Dr. Salonius, please. Hello, Lina. I'll put my video on. Um, I'm interested in St. Ephraim at the moment, and I was just wondering, um, do you have any indications of the patronage of that panel? None. If only. Uh, no, I, I'm afraid no. Um, we know next to nothing um, about it. Um, so the uh, it was bought in the 19th century from a Florentine collection. Um, so the Toscan kind of um, uh, 
connection seems to be quite strong. Um, but other than that, um, it's everything is up in the air. So maybe it um, came, it, it seems to have come from, perhaps came from the Florentine collection, which means perhaps a Florentine, perhaps it's so up in the air, you're right, a Florentine uh, patron. Thank you. It was just fascinating. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So um, thank you very much, Dr. Salonius. Uh, are there any more questions, please? So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Kuneni. We're moving to the, uh, the second paper of uh, Theodoros Yosifidis' uh, paper, um, Aspects of uh, Pictorial Themes of the Complex of Santa Maria Novella in Florence. Uh, do you have any questions for this paper? Uh, if not any, we're moving to uh, Dr. Salonius's paper. Dendrocentric messaging and Sylvan signs, borrowing from the Book of Nature in the Byzantine Empire and Central Italy. Your very interesting paper, and uh, I, I know the dissertation of my friend Stavros Gululis on uh, the tree of uh, Jesse. So, um, uh, are there any uh, questions for this very interesting paper? Do you have any other comments on the spread of this iconography, the type of this iconography uh, during the 13th and 14th century? Do you have any other thoughts? Hmm. <laughs> well, yes. Um, actually, I'm I'm interested. Um, I I wonder if there is a connection between the environment of the Franciscans, because I'm thinking more, uh, not of the Tree of Jesse, but how it, I, I think there is a connection between the Tree of Jesse and the Franciscan iconography of the Tree of Life. Um, They're both mnemonic um, schemata. And I, I wonder, I'd like to go further back and think about the environment that the Franciscans were in, which I think is a forested environment. Umbria was very densely forested at the time. And I think the environment would have affected uh, the way people thought. Um, I know St. Francis and Bonaventure were both at La Verna, which was um, the hermitage. Um, on at, in um, between Cusi and Spoleto, and I, the areas of Spoleto, and I just and Orezzo, and I, I wonder. Um, evidently, this area was densely populated with hermits, among whom there were Syrian hermits. Um, there is a number of them, and I wonder if there's any connection between, um, if there can be some kind of nexus between uh, this influx of Syrian hermits, these small hermitages, um, these people who were populating the forest there, and the, the new Franciscan orders. I just wonder um, if there is any kind of interaction there. Yes. Um, are there any comments on uh, on your thoughts? Um, no. Uh, so we uh, thank you very much. We're moving to the paper of uh, Silvia Pedone. Uh, she's not uh, here with us, but uh, any suggestions? We have so much about pseudo-Kufic script, and uh, recently. Uh, there are some papers uh, noting that uh, uh, some uh, of these inscriptions 
uh, read the uh, Allah, but Allah is not uh, the God of uh, Muslims. Is Allah the God um, himself in churches? So there are some recent papers on this topic. And um, are there any questions, suggestions for this, uh, the use of pseudo Kufi script in iconography? Uh, we don't have any um, comments, so we move into uh, Professor Concina's paper on uh, this uh, iconography between East and West, the monstrous races and infidels in the illuminations of this uh, uh, Coccarelli Codex, 14th century. It's uh, magnificent, this codex, and it also contains uh, pictures of uh, buildings and uh, ports and so on. It's very unusual and very rich and in my opinion is one of the most important um, iconography in manuscripts of the 14th century. So are there any uh, comments, uh, suggestions for Dr. Consinus's paper? Um, I may ask a question. Uh, you spoke about the role of medieval best bestiaries in the iconography of this manuscript. Mm -hmm. uh, how, uh, up to which extent we can uh, limit this uh, influence um, uh, on this manuscript? It's uh, limited to a certain folio, if I... I as far as I remember, yes. Uh, no, no, really, it's not limited to to a certain folio because uh, um, especially which is uh, the the best preserved one uh, devoted to the vices. You have many other, uh, you know, images of animals, animals fighting, and and so on. And so, some of these, for instance, you know, the the monstrous rate, the hybrids especially, have some terms of comparison in other manuscripts, uh, European mainly, French and even Italian manuscripts uh, for the hybrids. And for what concerns the, the strange thing is that have you might have seen, perhaps even if in one just one slide, uh, on the other side, you have animals very well represented, uh, especially insects and so on, uh, in a very naturalistic way. And so you have the two. You have inspiration both from bestiaries, also in other leaves, and from the natural world, reproduced in a very precise and uh, uh, in a very precise way. So I can. I'm sorry, I can't see you anymore. I think. Uh, thank you okay. very much. We are okay. together with. Uh... Professor Vasilios Kukusas, uh, dealing with uh, organizing matters. So um, the president of the Hellenic. The president of the Hellenic Institute. Good morning. Good morning. And uh, thank you very much for your answer. Thank and, you. Um, if we are speaking about this notion of uh, Baltrusitis, the Le Moyennes Fantastique, so with uh, the, the iconography of Coccarelli Codex is included in this sense. Uh, the fantastic uh, world of uh, animals. Uh, the... Yes, but not only. It's not only fantastic. You have two. It's you have two faces. You have the fantastic with yes. inspiration from contemporary, you know, artifacts in Europe, and then you have the realistic one, which is stunning. It's really amazing. This uh, ability to reproduce in a very precise way, possible on some models because I didn't have the time to, to, to say this, but it's clear that in many, many nature uh, has at, had at his disposal uh, specimen as coins, maps, uh, nautical, nautical charts, portulans, and so on. 
also for the rendering of the cities, because as you may know, you have also the fall of Faker and Tripoli, all, you know, fights. It's very realistic, all these representations. Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, yes. And sometimes, no, because the hybrids are the standard hybrids, you know, with the body, half of the human body and half of an animal monstrous body. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome. Yes. Uh, Professor Michela Agazzi wants to ask uh, something. Mi scuso, in italiano. Non c'è problema. Lei no, ma per gli altri. Mi scuso. No, sono, mi ha molto, molto interessato la sua relazione, sono molto curiosa, andrò a leggere le cose che ha già scritto. E io ho studiato il testamento di Rioni, che è stato testamento a Tabriz, muovendo da Acri, e quindi mi sono occupata di questa fase e mi sono stata molto colpita dall'immagine del banchetto del Khan. E è il Khan... A Tabriz, in Siria, cioè il periodo del Canato, di quando i mongoli sono lì. Sì. Ah, e quindi è, è un'immagine molto veritiera, ecco, non di fantasia. Questo volevo sapere da lei. Se è un... Perché eh, sono gli anni in cui ci sono i contatti con i mongoli, i tentativi anche di... I rapporti. Sì, sì, sì. Addirittura, se non ricordo, um, rispondo magari in inglese, se non le dispiace. And sì. um, the, the, the image of the banquet of the Mongol Khan has been put in, as you might have seen images from the Tabriz school and so on, because uh, in, uh, in Ilkhanic miniature you have many scenes, not only with banquets, but coronation scenes, and this uh, might have been served as a model. I'm not sure, but uh, someone, somebody has tried to identify the Khan. I think they proposed Hulegu, uh, the, the Khan of Persia, and of course there were contacts, but we really don't know if this, it's, it's a very realistic scene, and also the ones with the small Mongol archers, uh, you may find, my, you find many uh, terms of comparison in Ilkhanic miniature, and of course you have contacts with the Mongols, I don't know if um, my idea and the general idea of other scholars is that possibly Minator was working in Italy with uh, models, so we are not sure, but yes, and uh, the grandfather, which never says who he is, but he says he's a member of the family, of the Cocarelli family, we have archival evidence, we have documents from the archives, uh, in Cyprus and for Acre, we know that he moved from Provence because the family was for, from Provence to Acre. And then the, he left possibly for Cyprus or for Genoa before the fall of Acre in 1291. And this, it's uh, we have really historical documents about that. We have uh, deeds, uh, uh, Lamberto of San Buceto's deeds for Cyprus. Uh, and we have also deeds in Genoa, in the archives, uh, the state archive of Genoa concerning this Pellegrino Cocarelli. And this is the nephew writing the treatise. Uh, and the, the very interesting thing is that this has a family book. So it's very small. It's for children. It's like, uh, you know, the small format of the soul. Some many specimens of them in uh, in European manuscripts, uh, and uh, yes, they had contact with the, the Outremer, the, the Latin East, uh, at least, and with Cyprus. This is certain. With the Mongol Khans, yes, it's the period. Of course, it's the right moment. I really don't know, but you have images that circulate at the time, and so it's very possible they came in contact, of course, with with models or even with people. We know there were, were a large number of slaves, unfortunately, in Genoa and in Venice. We have documents about that. And so you have also real life models. I hope I answered your, your question. Grazie, grazie. Grazie a lei. Grazie, Professor Concina. Um, and we're moving to our last speaker, uh, Professor Bulgaropoulou, uh, with your very interesting paper and your uh, discovery uh, of this um, icon from Harvard Art Museums. Uh, 
which combines uh, religious and uh, secular iconography. Are there any questions for this very interesting paper? Yes, Professor. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just a curiosity. So thank you very much, Margarita, for your paper. It was really interesting to me. And uh, I have not really understood, but it's my fault, of course, uh, since I'm even not an, an art historian, I'm a philologist, but you are suggesting that they used uh, a material, a piece of something made in Venice, possibly, but I didn't understand where the icon was made, in Crete or in uh, in Venice, in Europe, I don't know. Yeah, so thank you so much for your kind words. Uh, well, this is exactly uh, the uh, matter of confusion uh, that uh, we cannot be sure. And this is exactly uh, what I am uh, suggesting in this paper that uh, in that time, in the uh, late medieval and early modern period, uh, there was such uh, uh, a constant commercial and uh, transcultural exchange between Venice and Crete, uh, in general, the Venetian Stato Damar, uh, and uh, such items uh, like uh, chess, uh, cassoni, or uh, icons were circulating all the time between uh, Venice and Crete. Uh, so there are indications to suggest that uh, this chest, this icon was made uh, in Venice because uh, the painting support, uh, the chest, uh, was, uh, as it seems, Italian or uh, even, uh, to put it more, uh, to narrow it down, from the Veneto. Um, but uh, again, we cannot be sure if this was actually shipped to Crete uh, and in the possession of some uh, Venetian, uh, local Venetian family or patrician family. Uh, and there uh, it was uh, taken to pieces and given over to the uh, painter who later on uh, painted the icon on its front, so, oh, like the Casona's back, but uh, the icon's front. Uh, or if this actually took place in Venice, where at the time uh, there was a community uh, of painters from Crete, uh, predominantly from Crete, who were painting exactly in that uh, style in uh, the Venetian capital. So uh, without, of course, uh, any documentation, written documentation, it's very hard to draw uh, concrete conclusions but in my opinion, this is exactly what uh, is interesting about this icon, that uh, it shows precisely how intense uh, these, uh, con these contacts were. Uh, from my understanding, as I uh, also mentioned in my paper, uh, it seems rather unlikely to imagine that uh, the chest would have been in the possession of a Cretan family, um, because usually in Crete, uh, such chests were very highly valued, Venetian chests, especially with such designs. So it is hard to imagine that they would take it apart like that and uh, not that uh, long after uh, its commission. Um, so whoever was the commissioner, in my opinion, they were very wealthy and could afford uh, to disassemble such uh, a beautiful uh, and valuable uh, item. So, yes, that's yeah, my... Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. Because I'm interested in this because I have the same problem with the illuminations of the, another manuscript, which is connected to the Cocarelli family and has some illuminations which are clearly uh, show, display a Byzantine influence, but possibly the manuscript is not clear if it, it was made in Italy, and uh, it demonstrates also that it could have been done, um, written and illuminated in Venice, and it is not clear, it's, it's this time of uh, iconographical models between uh, Greece and, uh, you know, Venice or even Genoa, but Venice 
we know this, it's more likely to be the, the right place to, to place these, man, these artifacts. So thank you very much. Thank you. In my opinion, this is the beauty of uh, these uh, objects. <laughs> it's very hard to, to place them. It's also the pain. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, uh, Professor Livia, good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, fine. Thank you. Um, I also have a question for um, Dr. Bulgaropoulou. Uh, first of all, thank you for your fascinating, absolutely fascinating presentation. Uh, as you can imagine, it's something that um, uh, interests me a lot because I'm also working on objects that travel and that sometimes are difficult to locate as far as their um, making is concerned and production. Um, I was wondering, but this is, might be something that I missed, so it's my fault in this case in your uh, presentation, but um, there is an interesting point about chronology because if I, if I understood well, um, this reuse uh, happened very early after the production of the cassone of the chest, right? So there is not so um, so a lack of time that is so long. If I, if I understood well, or maybe maybe I missed something again. So everything is relative, of course. So. Uh... <laughs> From uh, comparing the cassone with other similar uh, objects from uh, uh, North Italy and the Veneto, I could place it somewhere in the mid uh, 15th century, uh, 1470s, uh, the latest, I would say. Um, the icon, on the other hand, I would place it around 1500. Yes, so again uh, with some it, maybe, reservation, maybe a half a century at the late uh, uh, as yes. Possible. So yeah. it's not that in my understanding again, uh, it's not that big of a time lag to uh, explain that okay, we are in the 17th century and this is already I don't know uh, obsolete and uh, new fashion uh, has come and uh, replaced it. Um, in the 16th century, the beginning of the 16th century, as I mentioned, the fashion changes and it changes drastically. So these uh, uh, Gothic uh, looking objects uh, start to uh, be replaced in the wealthier uh, uh, households. Uh, so this is why uh, my understanding is that it must have been, it must have taken place in a wealthier environment that could afford this. Uh, of course, we can't uh, exclude the possibility that the, the object was damaged for whatever reason, uh, and therefore it was scrapped. But um, from the evidence that I have in my hands, uh, this is the, uh, the conclusion that I could draw. Yes, because actually you touched the next point that I was going to um, touch upon. Uh, so I was wondering whether if that could maybe... So you have evidence of actual use of the chest, if I understand, because it, I, I was wondering whether it was a piece maybe that was prepared for a cassone, but maybe not used for that. And in the workshop, they, they had that nice piece of wood but couldn't be used for uh, for its actual purpose and painted over i don't know I, it was uh, just an idea I, yeah uh, to my, to be honest i doubt that because it was actually so the designs were uh properly mm -hmm. sized they were uh they had their pigments uh all these paste the putties uh in the background in the highlights there are some um, uh, possible uh, uh, traces of gilding as well. All this couldn't have taken place if it was uh, some failed experiment, I believe. And also it's uh, evident that it was cut. Uh, so yes, yes, of course. there was more on the left side. So it, this was the uh, fragment from the right uh, part of the front of the chest. And it is evident that uh, the, the designs continued. Uh, so if it was some failed experiment, I 
don't imagine that they would have uh, gotten into this depth of uh, uh, decoration. Uh, perhaps they would have made the, the incised design, but they wouldn't have uh, pigmented it. They wouldn't have colored it or uh, added the, the hinges or what else. The hinges uh, themselves are an indication that it was actually used. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you Great. for your questions. Are there any more questions for uh, Professor Bulgaropoulou? So uh, I would like to congratulate you on your paper. And I would say that uh, I, um, I agree with your attribution to of the uh, piece of uh, chest to the uh, late uh, 15th century. And uh, uh, there is a general tendency uh, after the works of uh, Angelos de Liborias to attribute all the chest uh, uh, in Greece, found in Greece uh, in the Cretan workshops. I believe that it's not the case because uh, um, chests like uh, the one in uh, Benaki Museum with the Battle of uh, Lepanto and the chest from Folegandros um, that we're going to present to our last paper uh, are have typical characteristic of uh, the Cretan workshops, I would say. That is the engravings together with sample of techniques and pyrographic uh, and um, uh, technique. And the iconography is uh, related to topical, um, uh, let's say, themes. Uh, but uh, this, uh, the piece of uh, that you showed us is more elegant. Let's say it uh, would be uh, more um, appropriate to Venice itself. And I personally found the Cassone in the monastery of Vatopedi, Mount Athos, which is uh, totally different from the other Cassone found in uh, Greece. And I attribute this Cassone to a North Italian workshop. That means. We don't have uh, production only from Venice, we have from other workshops and also from Cretan workshops, which were famous uh, for the production of uh, Cassone and Dr. Uh, Panopoulou would uh, present us uh, literally evidence about this production of uh, good and secular pieces. So I would like to congratulate you and uh, I wish good luck to your projects. Thank, Thank you, you so much, uh, both for your kind words and also for agreeing uh, with my attributions. I really look forward to uh, seeing this uh, Cassone that you mentioned. Uh, in fact, I absolutely agree with you that uh, this piece, this fragment, looks absolutely uh, different than uh, the pieces found uh, in Greece uh, for the most part. And if I may add, it is even more elegant, even more refined than pieces uh, found in Italy as well. So um, most of the comparative uh, uh, material that I have is, in my opinion, of uh, lower quality. So uh, perhaps the only one that reaches the same level is a Cassona in the Cadoro in Venice, which is attributed to a, a workshop from the Veneto. The other Cassoni that were made in the Adige Valley in Friuli, uh, in my opinion, they are much uh, uh, simpler, uh, not as refined in the decorations. This is uh, a work of a very highly skilled uh, workshop if one actually uh, pays attention to the details, uh, despite, of course, the damage that uh, it has uh, suffered. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank all the contribu contributors and uh, um, all the people who um, um, were together with us in this first session. Uh, we ended up with uh, our first session and our last, uh, next session we will be the second session devoted to Italian art in uh, continental and insular Gr Greece. And uh, Professor uh, Livia Bevilacqua will be the moderator. Uh, Livia, uh, we are much uh, in advance. So what do you think? What time we can start uh, our session? Could start earlier if you want.
Um, yes, as you as you prefer. Mm, let us know when. Yes. Uh, can we have when you want us to begin? A pause uh, of uh, twenty minutes, let's say, or uh, twenty-five minutes. We could begin and uh, twelve uh, twenty or twelve uh, fifteen, if you want. 12, yes, uh, for me. Okay. Yes. Okay. It's okay. So what? Twelve twenty. Twelve fifteen. We have a, a 12, 15. Short, uh, break. Okay. So we have more time for time for a coffee break. Yes. Thank okay. you very much. See Thank you. you. See you later.
Livia, uh, hello again. Uh, you can start. Okay. Yes, there we are. Thank you. Um, I was wondering whether um, all the speakers of the session are here. I'm I want just... to inform you just a moment. Um, uh, Dr. Zoitu just she just sent me a message. She has some health problems, so she could not present uh, her paper. Sofia Zoitu, it's uh, the fourth in a uh, row. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. So um, good morning again, everyone. And thank you, the uh, organizing committee and to the Hellenic Institute for um, hosting all of us. Um, welcome to the second session of the conference titled Italian Art in Continental and Insular Greece, which I'm honored to chair. Uh, it looks like an exciting and varied session in which we have five papers, or not four papers, because um, I was just told that one is um, one of the speakers is uh, not here today. Um, so uh, let us begin straight away with uh, the first paper. It is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of the session, Dr. Magdalena Ganczarska. Yes, uh, thank you. Good morning. Uh, Dr. Ganczarska is from the Institute of Art History at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow. And she is going to deliver a paper titled Not only Dionysius of Furna, some remarks on the reception of Italian treatises on art in Greece and Balkans. Uh, floor is yours. Please share your screen if you okay. need. Yeah, thank you very much. And just give me a second and I share my screen with you with a short presentation I've prepared for today. Okay. Probably everything should be now okay so yes we can see okay thank you very much so uh, I, I think i i could i can start so uh, today uh, i would like to briefly discuss the problem of uh, balkans painters who tried to assimilate knowledge from the italian treatises on art uh, and i also believe i also argued that they didn't absorb this text uncritically but battered to accommodate them to the specific needs of orthodox painters. So, uh, Byzantine texts on art techniques are pretty few, as we know. So far, we mainly only have some single recipes or relatively small collections of them. And they come primarily from the Middle Byzantine period and uh, as we know, they are scattered among various texts. So we find them, for example, in texts on alchemy or medicine, but nevertheless, they are undoubtedly a very precious resource for us. And the essential written source for learning about Byzantine art techniques is Hermeneia, prepared by Dionysius of Furna. And he was a monk and painter associated with Mount Athos. There, as well as in his hometown, he executed uh, various paintings and some of his artworks have been preserved. But as we know, so maybe just for a minute, some examples. Here we can see St. John the Baptist and, and here Nativity and just one example of his fresco uh, evangelist look. But, uh, but what I said, uh, he's best known as the author of the Hermeneia, and he was also a painting teacher. And Hermeneia is probably, as we suppose, related to his teaching activity because in 1740, he obtained the consent of the Patriarch of Constantinople, Nofetas VI, to run a painting school in Agrafa, located nearby his native 
Furna. So the number of copies of the Hermeneia is estimated now at, let me say, 41. And this text is a manual for painters consisting only of texts. So none of its known to us manuscripts have illustration miniatures. So it is a logically, quite logically ordered guide, including two main parts. The first one is devoted to painting technique and the second one to iconography. In both, the basic unit of, unit of text is a, is a recipe or an explanation for the second part. And we can say that they are limited to the most essential information only. And this specific form validates our assumption that Hermeneia was intended for didactic purposes. So, Hermeneia is undoubtedly an important source, also available concerning in the context of Byzantine art. Nevertheless, it was created in the 1730s. Therefore, in the iconographic part, some descriptions prove the reception of Western iconography by Dionysius and some traces of this tendency, Westernization, let me say, we can also observe in the part of painting technique. And despite its late creation date, scholars, however, pay attention only to the Hermeneia. And what is more, Hermeneia is considered a source that faithfully transmitted the early, uh, early Byzantine tradition. And therefore, it is perceived as an exceptionally significant text concerning Byzantine art. However, we know that in the post-Byzantine period, painting manuals were quite widespread in the Balkans and they were called uh, Ermini. And this term, this term is very ambiguous, but above all, it means explanation or interpretation. And it was also used in the context of exegesis of the Holy Scriptures. As I mentioned, painting manuals were quite popular in Balkans. And for example, we have the so-called typicon of Bishop Nectarius, which is earlier than Dionysius manual, because the typicon was probably created before 1584. And to sum up this part, I would like to stress the need for researching Byzantine and post-Byzantine sources on art techniques and iconography because it's still very valid. Because the Hermeneia of Dionysius, to some extent, crowns the tradition of this type of writing, but it doesn't open it. So we should, uh, should uh, know, know this. So Dionysius is sometimes portrayed as a traditionalist who propagated old maniera. So he propagated Byzantine art in the Balkan Peninsula in the 18th century, and the researchers indicate that in response to the growing knowledge of Western art in the Balkans, Dionysius proposed the revival of Paleologan painting. And in this context, the Hermeneia of Dionysius is worth comparing with the treatise on painting Perizographias by Panayotis Doxaras of Corfu. And Hermeneia of Christopher Zeparovich. And these two authors, active painters as well, represented attitudes towards really religious art that differed from uh, Dionysius. So Doxaras, as a representative of the so-called Heptanese school, operated mm, on the Ionian island, which were not under Turkish rule, as we know, postulated a turn towards Western European painting, especially Italian. And as we know, he studied painting in Italy and then settled with his family, first in Kalamata, but finally, uh, finally uh, in uh, Lefkada. And during, after his study, he prepared uh, his uh, manual. 
So uh, first, uh, he prepared the Greek first Greek translation of the Trattato della Pittura of Leonardo da Vinci, and also his translations of treatises of Leon uh, Battista Alberti and Andrea Pozzo. So it was uh, quite uh, important uh, for him. And then he also wrote, mentioned, uh, mentioned uh, text on painting, and it was published in Athens in 1871. And we can assume that the Doxaras wanted to theoretically transmit, uh, transmitted the essence of his study of Italian painting and his technical experience as well. That is why he, was, he has written some books on painting. And what is very interesting, uh, his publisher, Lambros, mentioned uh, that uh, Doxaras considered it necessary and beneficial to prevent his contemporary artists from continuing to paint in the traditional way of orthodox art. And Doxeras characterized uh, these old works as dry and crude. So in 1726, uh, he wrote the theoretical text, Peri uh, Isografias, in which he, in addition, to an exposition on drawing color composition and some suggestions relating to painters worth imitating. He also included 24 recipes for varnishes and also, what is quite interesting, instructions on gilding. And in fact, he uh, prepared a kind of anthology of translated text and therefore his treatises Geographias is not an original work. And in detail, the first part of Doxara's work, entitled Clini di Dascalia, is a translation of a Marco Boschini's short artistic guide, Le Ricche Minere della Pittura Veneziana, published in Venice in 6074. And the second uh, text, uh, Nutasia is to Sneus, is a translation of a short text. Uh, by Pellegrino Antonio Orlandi from Bologna, and it was published in 1790. And it is included in the artistic encyclopedia of the same author called Abecedario Pittorico. And the first third text, entitled Erminia es, uh, is uh, Diafora Vernicia, is a translation of a chapter or, in, of Vernici di Perse from from another section of Abecedario. So finally, the last part of the work of Doxaras and Minia is probably a translation from another Italian work, another Italian treatises. So uh, he influenced to some extent, let me say, some painters, but not so many <laughs> with his example. And it is evidenced by the activity of his son, Nicolas, uh, as well as of Christopher Jefarovic, who adapted Italian painting of high Renaissance and Baroque, and also wrote his own treatise on painting. And his manual is also a compilation. And, and the first uh, part contains a theoretical Exposition, exposition based on Leonardo da Vinci, treatise translated, translated by Doxaras, but in general, Jefarovic proposed a hybrid path, let me say, which involved taking into account the achievements of Western painting in the technical field, while maintaining the content basis um, based on the tradition of the Orthodox Church and his uh, work didn't go unnoticed, but uh, but didn't equal the importance of Hermeneia of Dionysius of Furna, which was copied um, on a largest, more larger scale. So sometimes the role of contacts between the Balkans and the Western world in the first half of the 18th century is emphasized, pointing, pointing out that at that time, the Greeks experienced a kind of split 
between the old and well-known Byzantine tradition and the new culture reaching from the West. Researchers indicate uh, that these tendencies were reflected into opposing, uh, opposing artistic attitudes. The traditional one, represented by Dionysius, and the pro-Western one, embodied uh, primarily by Doxaras, who used a Venetian uh, artist as model. Dionysius postulating the imitation of Manuel Pancelinos was to join the efforts to protect and preserve Byzantine tradition. And his Hermeneia is interpreted as a manual, sometimes interpreted as a manual indicated to facilitate the acquisition of the secrets of paintings and even to revive earlier art. And we can say that his painting school was also supposed to be uh, subordinated to his goal. But the aim of these three painters has a complex character and it well reflects the compilated history of sacred painting of the Eastern Church after the fall of the Byzantine Empire. On the one hand, preserving patterns, both technical and iconographic, developed in Byzantium, and the other hand, influenced by Western art, which not only direct contact in contacts were made possible, but also graphics uh, reaching the far, farthest corners of Greece. All three, despite everything, escaped simple divisions into two approaches to the renewal of art in the Orthodox Church. Therefore, I believe the text should be looked at carefully paying attention to details. So uh, thank you very much for uh, attention. Thank you very much, Magdalena, for your uh, very interesting presentation, um, uh, which reminds us to look at these sources carefully and con contextualize them. Um, so um, I think there will be interesting material for discussion later. Uh, but now I would like to move forward to our second speaker, um, Konstantinos Gravanis. Ooh, I don't see actually. Yes, there he is. Good okay. morning. Hello. Um, welcome. Um, Dr. Gravanis is from National and Capodistrian University of Athens. Um, he works on Italian Renaissance, so he's going to present today on Raphael's network in Greece. Please, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, can you hear me and uh, see me and hear me properly? We can see you and hear you, but if you want, you can share your screen. Yeah, sure. Just bear with me a second. might take a while. We can see, but if you can put it full screen, it will be perfect. Mm -hmm. I yes. think I made it. OK. Thank you very much for the introduction. <clears throat> so the fascination of the Italian Renaissance with the cultural heritage of ancient Greece is well documented and needs no introductions. A special position among the admirers of Greece belongs to Raphael of Urbino, a towering figure of the Renaissance who took great efforts in studying and recreating the remains of antiquity. Very few artists of the early modern period were praised more than Raphael for their inspired emulation of the antique. However, our knowledge of Raphael's antiquarian interests and archaeological methods is very little. Documentary evidence is scarce, and even the surviving drawings that Raphael made after the antique are less than a dozen. My paper aims to specify and contextualize Raphael's interest for Greece. I will begin by showing that he was, he was one of the few Renaissance artists, if not the only one, who tried to access the art of ancient Greece in, its, in the Greek region for copying the antique. 
Then I will explore possible links of Rafael with Greece, including the trade routes of the Eastern Mediterranean and scholarly expeditions that may have been organized by the humanist friends of the artist. Apart from great draftsman, painter, and architect, Rafael was also a dedicated surveyor of the antique, a superintendent of monuments, an archaeologist, and a private collector of antiquities. As a matter of fact, the greatest task that Raphael ever undertook in his career was the graphic reconstruction of ancient Rome, a monumental project that remained incomplete due to the artist's untimely death in 1520 at the age of only 37. Raphael's fascination with the remains of the past is documented both visually and textually. For example, Giorgio Vasari, the famous art historian of the 16th century, informs us that Raphael had seen so many that quote, Raphael had seen so many antiques in the city of Rome and he studied them continuously, end of quote. Indeed, if we look at the earliest painting projects of Raphael in Rome, dating from 1508 onwards and commissioned by Pope Julius II and the famous merchant Agostino Chigi, we realize the amount of Raphael's inspiration from classical models and his desire to emulate Greek antiquity. That would include the frescoed images of Greek God in the Vatican Palace and the Villa Farnesina, but also an abundance of Greek inscriptions found in his frescoes, drawings, and printed compositions after his designs. Another important statement of Vasari is that Raphael was so eager to study the antique that he had sent assistant designers not only in Italy, but also in Greece, in order to have the relics of antiquity copied, translating his texts in English, in English, Quote, such was the greatness of Raphael that he had designers throughout Italy, in Pozzuolo, and as far as Greece. Neither did he fail to have everything good that could be useful for this art. End of quote. What Vasari says here is really fascinating. Raphael having designers in Greece. Uh, it is a bold claim that cannot be accepted without scrutiny. So had he really sent assistance to Greece and how did he manage? How exactly? Did he manage to do it? Our perception so far is that the fall of Constantinople in, 15, in 1453 and the continuous expansion of the Ottoman Empire had thrown an iron curtain between the Greek regions and the Latin world, making it hard for Italian antiquarians to conduct the research in Greece. The only known exception was Syriacus Dancona, who fully explored the area of the Eastern Mediterranean during the first half of the 15th century. Apart from his case, though, there is no other record of voyages of European antiquarians to Greece, at least not until the mid 16th century. And the trip of the French in this matter was summarized by Roberto Weiss, who remarked that, quote, despite crusades and trade, Latin rule and missionary effort, the archaeological study of the Greek world during the Renaissance practically began and ended with Syriacus Dancona. However, if Vasari's opinion is correct, then it changes our perception of the topic. And I believe he was correct. His claim that Raphael had sent assistance to Greece does not sound like a product of misinformation, and thus it should be taken seriously. It should be noted here that Vasari never met Raphael, but he had the fortune to meet and talk with many of Raphael's pupils after the master's death, most notably with Giulio Romano, the greatest disciple an artistic heir of Raphael. Vasari met Giulio in Mantua in 1541, and he actually stayed in his house for days. So it was probably Giulio Romano who informed him that Raphael had sent assistance in Greece. Another document of great importance for our topic is the famous letter of Raphael to Pope Leo X, surviving in multiple drafts and written probably in 1519 in collaboration with Baltasare Castiglione. In his historiographic description of the decline of the arts during the medieval period, Raphael praised the ancient Greeks as, quote, the inventors and perfect masters of all the arts. This statement alone is sufficient in understanding Raphael's admiration for Greek culture, but it also indicates that Raphael may have realized the technical and aesthetic superiority of the classical Greek models over the Roman copies that were everywhere to be found in Italy. As a matter of fact, we know that Raphael was a collector of ancient Greek sculpture. The humanist Piero Valeriano reports that he had seen in Raphael's house a marble statue 
of an aged man with a Greek inscription, Philemon, an Athenian poet of the fourth century before Christ. We don't know about the origins of this statue, but as Kathleen Christian has shown, it was most probably authentic. So given that Raphael was a collector of Greek artifacts, it makes perfect sense for him to have desired to study Greek monument monuments in their original context, as Vasari claimed. The statement of Vasari finds its strongest support in one certain piece of evidence. An anonymous print in the style of Agostino Veneziano represents the base of a Roman column with an inscription that reads, Basamente de la Colonna da Constantinopolo mandato a Raffaello da Urbino, meaning the basement of a column in Constantinople sent to Raphael of Urbino. There are many things we don't know about this image. We do not know when exactly the original drawing was made and by whom. We do not even know if the design, as we see, was produced in Constantinople or in Italy and whether Raphael may have modified it. Also, we don't know the identity of this monument. Some have seen it as the base of the column of uh, Theodosius, but this is probably wrong because the column was demolished in the early 16th century. Others have observed that the victories, its victories with wings, are strikingly similar with those of the column um, of Marcian. So this seems to be the best candidate we have. But what we do know for sure is that this, the inscription of this print, is the only evidence supporting Vasari's claim that Raphael kept assistant designers in Greece for recording the relics of antiquity, relics of either Roman or Greek origin. It also seems that Raphael had knowledge of the column base in Constantinople and that he used it in his decoration plans for Leo X, for Pope Leo X in the Salad Constantino in the Vatican Palace. This proposal was made half a century ago by John Sherman, who noticed that the invention and pose of the winged victories in the print are very close, almost identical, with the winged caryatids designed by Raphael for an unexecuted project in the Salad Constantino. So the big question now is how did Raphael manage to send his assistance to Constantinople? I believe the most probable answer is that he used the commercial network and trade route of Agostino Chigi, a close friend of his. Chigi was one of the wealthiest merchants and bankers in Europe. 20,000 men worked for him all around the world and 100 ships sailed under his flag. His numerous branch houses were installed all around Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean, from Lyon, Amsterdam, and London to Constantinople, Alexandria, and Cairo. Kiji was in good terms with the Ottoman Sultan, Bayezid II, who is said to have sent him noble horses and dogs as gifts, addressing him as the great merchant of Christendom. We also hear stories of luxurious banquets in the Roman villa of Kiji, where he would impress his guests with exotic meals that included tongues of parrots and eels imported by Constantinople. It is also worth noting that Agostino Chigi was a serious patron of Greek letters who funded the setting up of a printing press in one of his venues for the production of ancient Greek texts. Considering also the fact that Chigi was a very good friend of Raphael, then it makes good sense to assume that he assisted him with his antiquarian expeditions in Constantinople and elsewhere by allowing Raphael's assistance to embark on his ships. One might even assume that the vast trade routes of Kiji could have allowed Raphael to study not only the remains of antiquity in Greece, but also the Egyptian antiquities in Cairo and Alexandria. Another possible connection between Raphael and the Greek territories was through his Roman network of humanist friends who desired to promote Greek studies. The peak of Raphael's career in Rome coincided with the election of Giovanni de' Medici as Pope Leo X in 1513. Leo was the son of Lorenzo the Magnificent de' Medici, both of whom actively supported the revival of Greek studies. From the first year of his papacy, Leo X bestowed Aldus Manutius with the exclusive privilege of publishing Greek texts, and he also founded the Greek College in Rome, or the Greek Academy as it was sometimes called. As a result, many Greek scholars and exiles visited Rome and enjoyed the patronage of the Medici Pope. Eminent humanists like Janus Lascaris, Pierio Valeriano, Angelo Colocci, Fra Giovanni Giocondo, Baltasare Castiglione, Pietro Bembo, and others. 
We know that Rafael became friend with all these individuals uh, who would have further stimulated his interest in the Greek antiquities. His most important source of first-hand information would have been the famous Greek humanist and emigre Janus Lascaris. During the previous decades, Lascaris had traveled to the Greek homeland twice as an ambassador of Lorenzo de' Medici. He reportedly visited Corfu, Arta, Thessalonica, Mount Athos, Crete, and Constantinople, where he collected hundreds of Greek manuscripts, thus playing a huge role in preserving Greek heritage. In 1513, Lascaris was invited by Leo X to direct the Greek college in Rome, and for this purpose, the Greek scholar sent Marcos Musuros to Greece for recruiting gifted students from Corfu, Kithira, and Crete. These children were the first students of the newly founded Greek college in Rome under the sponsorship of Leo X. So it is not impossible that during the scholarly expeditions of Lascaris in the Greek region, Raphael may have found an opportunity to send his assistance for copying ancient monuments. The two men knew each other well, and after the unexpected death of Raphael, Lascaris dedicated a Greek epigram to him. It has, even, it has even been suggested by John Sherman and other scholars that the portrait of Lascaris was included next to the portrait of Leo X in Raphael's famous tapestry cartoon of St. Paul preaching in Athens, a work intended for the magnificent tapestry decoration of the Sistine Chapel. In any event, the safest bet for Raphael's antiquarian purposes would be the islands, since these regions were largely free from Ottoman control and easier to access. For example, Cyprus and Crete were under the rule of Venice, while the island of Rhodes was ruled by the Order of Knights of the Hospital of St. John. It is worth noting that Giulio de' Medici, the trusted advisor and cousin of Pope Leo X, was made a Knight of Rhodes in 1513. Giulio shared the humanistic interests of his cousin, so it is not impossible that the delegation or expedition to Rome, to Rhodes, may have been organized by him. Unfortunately, there is no document to support these ideas. Therefore, all these suggestions have a speculative character. A last point I would like to make is that even if Raphael had a great difficulty in accessing the Greek territories, he would certainly have some indirect knowledge of its antiquities. For example, his Caryatids in the Vatican Stanza di Leodoro indicate that he probably knew the type of the Erechthion Caryatids in the Acropolis. This knowledge would have come not by visiting Athens, which was probably impossible at the time, but by studying the Caryatids in Hadrian's villa in Tivoli or the Caryatids in the form of Augustus in Rome, which were modeled after the Erechthion type. Alternatively, he may have seen the sketchbook of the architect Giuliano da Sangallo in Rome, who had access in the drawings of the Parthenon by Syriacus d'Ancona. The same conclusion can be reached for other inventions of Raphael, examination of his frescoes in the Sala di Constantino and the Villa Farnesina convinced scholars like Philip Fell that Raphael had knowledge of the Parthenon friezes in the Acropolis, but this knowledge must have been indirect. I will put a full stop here because um, I think my time is up and I will conclude by saying that the topic of Raphael's potential networks in the Greek region is a largely unexplored area of great interest. The problem here is, of course, the lack of documents, which relegates most arguments to the level of conjecture. However, I believe that further research on this topic, and especially further investigation of the graphic production of Raphael and his circle, can provide us with important insights about his links with the Greek region. And that would include not only his drawings, but also the prints after Raphael's designs, which circulated in areas of Greece like Mount Athos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Gravanis, for this fascinating presentation. Uh, I think there will be a lot of material for discussion later uh, as well. And um, um, let, let us move now, if you can um, stop sharing your screen, please. So you, thank you. So you can move on to uh, the next paper, which will be delivered by Dr. Yanti Asimakopoulou. 
who is assistant professor at the National and Capodistrian University of Athens as well. Um, and she teaches European art history, 14th to 17th century. And as you can already see, she's going to speak on Raphael's Massacre of the Innocents, Sources and Interpretations. Please, Dr. Asim Kopulu, floor is yours. Uh, good morning to everyone. I hope you can hear me and see my presentation. Yes. Fine. Uh, the biblical uh, massacre of the innocents, as conceived by Raphael and engraved by Raimondi, does not constitute an event connected exclusively with particular time and space. The drama of persecuted mothers who try to protect their babies is still played in many neighborhoods of our planet. The massacre of the innocent at uh, the uh, copy at the National Gallery of Athens is among the most famous engravings of the High Renaissance. Although there is no exact cartoon, it must have been Raphael himself who provided the famous printmaker from Bologna with an explicit drawing of the scene. I shall argue that the Roman architectural background that appears in the print, but not in Raphael's surviving working drawings, is an organic part of the whole composition, urging the viewer to detect the multiple layers of meaning embedded in uh, the work. Yet before analyzing the narrative of the infanticide and discussing the urban and architectural development in Rome during the pontificates of the two de la Rovere popes that might be related to the complex composition, this presentation will attempt to trace ancient sources for some of Raphael's figures. The two versions of the engraving called the Massacre of the Innocents with uh, Fir Tree and the Massacre of the Innocents without the Fir Tree have long perplexed scholars whether it might signal self-replication or might indicate two different hands. In the engraving at the National uh, Gallery of Athens, the upper right part of the sheet is missing and uh, lettered on uh, uh, the plinth is uh, um, the inscription referring to the second version, the massacre without the fir tree. The engraving depicts a tragic episode from uh, the Gospel of Matthew, narrating that the king of Judea, Herod, having heard from the Ma Magi that the newborn child was destined to become king of the Jews, ordered the execution of all male children under the age of two. In the foreground of the print, a group of uh, women and infants are being attacked by soldiers swaying their swords. They include to the left a, a woman over a dead child in a pietà-like pose, two infants rendered in strong foreshortening, lying on the perspectively drawn pavement, a woman in the foreground center running directly towards uh, the viewer and holding tightly a newborn, and to the right, a kneeling woman holding a baby in her right hand and her left outstretched to stop the attacker. Despite the violent uh, subject, the final composition constitutes an elegant display of Raphael's Alantica style, especially in relation to the treatment of the body and the modeling of the forms. The running female figures with both arms outstretched and her head turning to the opposite direction, the figure here at the background, directly echoes fleeing Dacians from Trajan's column. In fact, the figure appears in multiple variations in reliefs spiraling the famous Roman monument erected in the Forum of uh, Trajan. Curved on it is the story of two wars by Emperor uh, Trajan against the Dacians, a tribe living in present-day Romania. Giving, um, given its uh, outstanding place in Roman history, it has attracted the attention of artists and scholars since at least the second half of the Quattrocent. Of interest to our topic, the running female figure with outstretched hands and the head turned to the opposite direction, the upper torso. 
RUT played 11 at 31 in a later edition, copying the scenes from a Trajan column. Illustrated there are uh, legionaries of fleeing and fleeing Dacians. One of the later turns his head backwards while his right outstretched arm covers his chin in a similar way as does the outstretched arm of the terrifying running mother in Marc Antonio's uh, print. Similarities appear also with the fleeing figure running in between trees in plate 44 in Bertoli Bellori's edition, the later one, and uh, next uh, soldier seen from behind holding above his hand a sword in Marc Antonio's engraving recalls male figures raising both hands in plates 16 and 19. In plate 19, the soldier is seen nude from behind and his ribs clearly shown. Another interesting case indicative of an Alantica form is the kneeling woman holding a baby in her right hand with her left outstretched to stop uh, the attacker. This pose echoes the stretching of both hands in opposite directions of a soldier working on uh, a wall in plate uh, 13. And at the same plate, uh, we have a Roman figure a Roman soldier that drives to the emperor, a Dacian holding from the hair, a gesture quite similar to Marc Antonio's engraving. In Raphael's uh, final uh, modello, the, the drawing that uh, is now at the Museum of Fine Arts in Budapest, there is no reference to the cityscape. It has been argued that since there is no extant drawing for the landscape background, Raphael left it to be added by Raimondi. I think, however, that the urban architectural landscape may provide valuable information about the place where the figural group is shown and might uh, refer to the architectural legacy of the Della Rovere popes. I will therefore argue that the spatial context within which the biblical group appears could offer a hint to the viewer to detect several meanings embedded in the work. The cityscape with a bridge which stops the straight line of the heads is the same as the one appearing in the Codex uh, Escurialensis. We see the, uh, the part here. The sketch put it includes the note Ponte Judeo above the urban landscape, indicating that the bridge behind the massacre could be the ancient Pont, Pons Fabricius. This bridge, also known as Ponte Quattro Capi, led from the Tiber Island to the Jewish section of uh, uh, Rome. At the time uh, Marc Antonio's engraving was created, circa 15, uh, 10, 15, 11, only two of uh, the nine ancient bridges spanning the Tiber had survived, and it is uh, uh, the bridge uh, at the Vatican and uh, the bridges at the Isola Tibertina, I mean the ancient Pons Fabricius and uh, Pons Sestus. During his pontificate, Pope Sixtus IV founded in 1473 in preparation uh, for the Jubilee, the bridge which he named after himself Ponte Sisto. And this was quite an appropriate quite appropriate since the title of the Pope, Pontifex, means actually bridge builder. In Marc Antonio's engraving, the soldier carrying out the massacre could be standing on a similar structure to the Ponte Quattro Capi appearing in the background of the print. And this could be the newly constructed Ponte Sisto, the first bridge built over the Tiber since antiquity. Ponte Sisto, linked the marketplaces to Ripa Grande, the river port uh, in Trastevere that Sixus IV had uh, restored. Along a protected route from Ripa Grande across Ponte Sisto to Campo dei Fiori and Piazza Navona, he connected central, the central markets uh, to Rome's uh, seaport Ostia and from there beyond to the Mediterranean trade routes. Thus, the foundation of the new bridge for the Jubilee of 1475 was effectively turned into an emblem of the urban and institutional renovatio orbis which Sixus IV wished to bring forward. The refunding of Rome after the troublesome decades 
the popes had resided in Ave Union, and the restoration of the city's glory as capital of Christianity was, after all, the central aim of the Sistine uh, Papacy. Obviously, the massacre of the innocents, depicting children ready to be slain or dead on the pavement of the bridge, is clearly an infanticide scene, which uh, iconography most viewers were familiar. The history of infanticide provides an important perspective on the extent postpartum abortion was practiced in early modern Europe and Italy also. The death of infants was of the most banal kind from the Middle Ages till the 19th century, and infant abandonment had, uh, been, has been broadly discussed uh, in recent studies. It is probable that um, younger and unwed mothers abandoned and intentionally killed their newborns, either to hide evidence of their illicit sexual activity or to attract another man and reproduce again in better conditions. The church authorities, with respect not only to the bodies but also to the souls of the unbaptized, supported foundlings hospitals as a way to deal with uh, infanticide. Among the most ambitious projects initiated by Pope Sixtus IV for the Jubilee of uh, 1475 related to the restoration of the urban uh, infrastructure was the re rebuilding of Hospital uh, Santo Spirito in Sassia, a house for the foundlings. And uh, Europe's uh, first hospital had been built by Pope uh, Innocent III to take care about the unwanted uh, offsprings in the uh, 12th century. The hospital and the fresco cycle decorating the Corsia Sistina marks an important stage in the development of Sixus IV self-fashioning. There are 34 scenes of his life present an image of himself as an ideal pope and his family as a quasi princely dynasty, the de la Rover. Interestingly, the narrative of the fresco starts with the birth of a baby and its premature death since it has been hit on the side of the head by a woman. She holds the uh, dead child from uh, the lower part of the torso while it still bleeds heavily. At the other end of the fresco, dead infants fished from the Tiber are shown to Pope Innocent III, the uh, founder of the hospital. The Latin inscription would uh, confirm the place where the children were disposed and uh, where the whole scene unfolds. The 15th uh, century inscription, now it's not uh, visible, contained biblical reference to Old Testament prophecies, reinforcing the visual allusion to the massacre of the innocent. As pertinently uh, Presciuti points out, text and image constitute a massacre meta-narrative shifting from the killing of the infants in the Old and New Testament to the horrible infanticide of the first scene. Like the mothers in uh, Raimondi's Massacre of the Innocent who are protecting their infants against uh, the assailants, Sixtus IV presents himself caring about the bodies of the, and the souls of unbaptized infants disposed at the waters of the Tiber and ready to restore social order. Thus, the iconography of the first fresco in Corsia Sistina functions as an institutional antidote to infanticide, while the visual rhetoric of Marcantonio's engraving could have hinted to Sixus IV control over the urban territory and contribution to the solution of a fiery social issue. In Corsia Sistina Fresco, Sixus IV shows rebuilding the hospital for the foundlings, enhancing the Roman theme of Renovatio Urbis. His nephew, the future Pope Julius II, took up the role of Cardinal Protector of the Confraternity running the hospital. In another episode of the Corsia Sistina, the first de la Rovere Pope is shown blessing Ponte Sisto, a project emblematic for refounding Rome during the pontificate. And his nephew, Giuliano de la Rovere, appears immediately behind him wearing the cardinal hat. It seems that Giuliano was involved in some way in the construction of the new bridge, a role that he may use successfully in anticipation of his own program of Renovatio Rome as a future Pope. 
The fresco, 64 rebuilds Ponte Sisto, clearly underlines the close symbolic connection between the Ponte Sisto and Santo Spirito in Sassi that defines the two ends of the loop network via Giulia and via Lungara, and by the implication, the partnership between the two uh, De La Rovere Popes. Actually, the continuation, uh, continuator of Sixus uh, urban design uh, interventions, Julius II, had expressed in his uh, intention to rebuild the Triumphalis Bridge, the ancient Pons Neronianus, whose landing stage would coincide with the complex of uh, buildings of Santo Spirito in Sassia. We see it at the uh, left part. Bramante, Julius uh, II papal architect, could have supported the restoration of uh, Pons Triumphalis because of the symbolic association of Pope Julius II with Julius Caesar, his imperial namesake and first triumphator. It is worth noting that uh, remains of uh, Via Triumphalis were found during the construction of uh, the Ospedale Santo Spirito under Pope Sixtus IV. It seems that the idea, uh, the idea to build uh, Pons Triumphalis circulated for a long time, judging by multiple representations of uh, the rebuilt bridge in uh, prints, maps, etc. Raphael's massacre of the innocent was executed by Raimondi. It takes place not in the biblical past, but is transferred in modern Rome. The composition could have had multiple layers of meaning for humanists and viewers well versed in the symbolic language and uh, the allusions to Julius II initiatives to transform the capital of Christianity in an altered Jerusalem and a renewed imperial city. If Ponte Quattro Capi appears at the background, the biblical scene could unfold on the first stone bridge built in Rome since ancient times, or allude to the triumphal bridge Julius II intended to rise victoriously from its ruins in front of the hospital Santo Spirito in Sassia, dedicated to the foundlings. The importance of the legacy of Sixtus IV in the Julian Renovatio is clear, and the reference to the new bridge became an emblem. Thus, a parallel could be drawn. As the mothers in the massacre of the innocents care for their offspring, in the same way the De La Rovere popes take care of their citizens and the city. Thus, Raphael and Raimondi deliberately chose an imagery of crime and sacrifice that seemed to be speaking to the present to create a powerful message of the De La Rovere Renovatio, securing for them lasting fame. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Asimakopoulou. Uh, it was uh, really, really interesting. And um, I think we can go back later during the discussion to your uh, paper. Uh, now I would like to invite our next speaker, who um, is not Sofia Zoitou, who is uh, not here today, but um, so I will go straight away to um, Nicolas Barren. Good morning, Nicolas. Um, he's a PhD candidate in art history at the Ecole Pratique des Autetudes in Paris. Uh, Nicolas Varenne is going to, pre to present a paper titled Greek, Latin, or both, the female saints of Venetian Crete in context. Please take on the floor. Yeah. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I'll try to put the PowerPoint in a full screen. Um, okay, do you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and see the PowerPoint. Thank you. Good, thank you. Uh, thank you for your introduction. And I would like to thank the organizers uh, of this conference for the opportunity to present my work today. I think I'm the last one before lunch, so I'll try to be brief. In a 1981 article entitled Western Influences and the 14th Century Out of Crete, Maria Veselaki listed the elements that bear witness to the impact of Western art on the artistic production of the island of Crete. 
which mentioned the existence of Gothic architecture, the presence of Western painters in Candia, and the knowledge of Venetian fashion, attested by the portraits of donors and church funders, as well as echoes of contemporary material culture in monumental wall paintings, for examples in depictions of uh, the Last Supper and the Feast of Herod, in which Venetian glass is visible on the table. We have an example of that here. The images of saints also attest to the development of a shared visual language that borrows from East and West, evidenced both by the use of such techniques as carved halos, of which we have an example here in the church of the Panayakera near Kvitsa, uh, and iconography. The most obvious iconographic examples are in the depictions of such Western saints as St. Francis of Assisi, who can be found in the same church at Kvitsa, or St. Bartholomew, carrying his skin on his shoulder, as can be seen in the church of St. Pelagia in Anonianos. Elements of costume also testify to the circulation of Western glass, both in the depictions of saints, and you have an example here of the holy women of the church of the Panaya Guarnotisa near Potamies, where the brocades and the fur-lined capes worn by the saints are unknown in the Byzantine tradition and in the painted hagiographic cycles that depict the martyrdom. These elements help us understand the reception of Western visual and material culture in the mixed society of Venetian Crete through uh, the lens of devotional art and its place in the assimilation and production of images that mirror the culture and ideology of their commissioners. My paper today focuses on hagiographic images, more specifically the images of holy women and the evidence of their cult in both the Greek and Venetian communities of Crete. A significant share of the artistic activity on Crete at the end of the Middle Ages concerned religious art, and the cult of saints is a point of entry into the preoccupations of the inhabitants of the island. It gives us an overview of the modalities according to which Italian art, here understood in the very broad meaning of art that borrows from Italian and Western iconography and art com commissioned by Venetians, could permeate the Byzantine tradition. Both the Greek and Venetian sides of the question will be addressed, first by observing the painted material preserved in churches, and then by looking at the documents kept in the Venice archives that give us a glimpse into the lost visual culture of the Italians living in Crete. It was not until very late in the church of the Panaya in the village of Vaya dated 1516, that we see the first incorporation of a Western attribute in the representation of a female saint, Catherine, who is depicted holding the wheel of her martyrdom. There is no other example of this iconography in Crete. She is also wearing a dress with embroidered ornaments that are far cry from her usual imperial costume, as is the crown, which is not shaped like that of Byzantine empresses, but rather like a Frankish crown in indicating evident permeability to Latin elements. However, I would be hasty to conclude from these borrowed elements that the founders of the church were favorably disposed towards the West. In fact, the rest of the hagiographic program of the church shows a strong orientation towards Byzantium. Several rare saints appear including Saint Theodosia, a martyr who distinguished herself in her fight against the iconoclasts, and Saint John of Damascus, of whom few representations are known in Crete, who also distinguished himself in the defense of early images. A certain orientation seems to appear in the central, centered on the promotion of orthodoxy, which is also present in the phylactery held by the church funders, the priest George Barujas and his wife. The phylactery includes a prayer to the Virgin, asking that all the Orthodox be saved from hell. The choice of this term, Orthodox, rather than the more inclusive Christians, can thus be seen as a vindication of an identity that is rather hostile to the Latins, which may seem surprising given the late date of the paintings, which were executed at a time when relations between communities were more peaceful. 
Western elements can also be detected in several narrative hydrographic cycles, such as that of St. Paraskevi, in the eponymous church in the village of Episcopi, a small distance from Candia. The beheading of the saint on the North Pole gives a prominent position to the soldiers, especially the one who has just executed the saint. He is wearing full armor in a manner unknown to the contemporary Byzantine army. The military costume, reconstructed by Maria Barani, consists of chainmail or cuirass and leggings, but never an articulated metal armor covering the entire body, as seen in the Episcopi for the scores, which is characteristic of 15th century military gear from northern Italy. I have here an example from circa 80, uh, 1480, named the Musée de l'Armée in Paris. In the vast majority of cases, uh, the presence of such Western elements in hydrographic scenes is the prerogative of characters that are opponents of the scenes and could be read as a sign of hostility. But the assimilation of Venetian soldiers to enemies of saints and therefore of the Orthodox needs to be assessed against the rest of the painted program of the church, which brings more nuance to such a reading of the image. Just below the scene of the saints beheading, the river of fire in the Last Judgment is depicted. Several figures are burning in the flames of hell. In addition to figures wearing Ottoman-style headdresses, Angeliki Lorbulu noted the presence of two women wearing Italian-style headdresses and three other figures, two of whom could be Western clerics and a Latin bishop. These elements could reinforce the anti-Latin sentiment of the cycles in Pataskevi, but the presence of an Orthodox bishop, in addition to the Latin one, easily identified by his homophorion adorned with a cross, suggests that the interpretation of the frescoes should be less unfavorable to the Latins. Rather than a rejection of the Venetians alone, it seems to be a broader denunciation of all bad Christians. The inclusion of Western elements, rather than as evidence of a negative view of the Venetian presence on Crete, could therefore be read as more neutral effet de réel, to quote Colombard, faces of reality that reflect what the painter could see around him and chose to include in his work. The two churches we have seen here bear witness to the moderate assimilation of Italian art in churches funded by Greek donors and the ambiguity of the reception of Western elements when it comes to hydrographic material. While these elements are accepted, they might come with a strong assertion of the founder's orthodoxy. In contrast, the production of Italian art on Crete, that is, the commission of images by Italian donors, suggests the possibility of a more effective embrace of Greek gods, as the interest in Byzantine holy women shows. This can be examined by turning to archival documents, which provide an essential counterpoint to the information provided by iconography and epigraphy. Indeed, the dedicatory inscriptions of Cretan churches do not mention any commissions by Latin donors and contain no clue as to their role in the artistic production of the island. The documents of the Latin notaries active on Crete have been edited by Sally McKee in 1998 no fewer than 480 published wills mention donations to churches or religious establishments, such as monasteries or hospitals, in the form of money, material goods, land, or the proceeds of a field or vineyard. 18% of the wills contain bequests to both Greek and Latin institutions and churches. The wills are almost all from residents in the town of Candia so it is not surprising that the majority of donations are concentrated in a small group of institutions in or near the town. In the case of churches in the countryside, by reason of changes in toponymy, it is more complicated to identify specific churches or villages with certainty, but it is sometimes possible. For example, the church of St. George in Constantine in the village of Pirgos is mentioned. On April 6, 1319, this church received a bequest from Helena Vaxalo, the widow of Julianus Vaxalo. It consisted in a donation of five papyri to buy gold for, the for an embroidery to decorate the altar. The donor appears to be Latin. 
given her numerous donations to establishments belonging to the mendicant orders in Gandia, as well as the Latin names of her parents and friends. Her daughter was named, named Anlis, and several members of the Venerio family, perhaps the formation of the Veneers of Venice, are mentioned in the well as well. That did not prevent her from making a donation to a rural Greek church, perhaps because it might have been close to her estate in the Cretan countryside. The dedication, uh, the inscription on the south aisle of the church states that it was built in 1314-1315, just four years before Elena Vaxalus' bequest. But it only mentions the Greek donors, George Pachmutis, his wife Xeni, and her son Pavlos. The contribution of the wills thus shows that the dedicatory inscriptions alone are not sufficient to understand patronage in Greece. A more specific case of piety towards a particular saint can be seen in the will of Maria, daughter of Thomas Avonale, dated January 15, 1333-1334. A resident of the Casale de Colena, perhaps the present-day village of Colena, she bore a name that certainly sounds Italian. Her bequests included for Hyperpera to the Church of the Virgin of her village, two others to Friar Michael of Hispania, chaplain of Castel Bonifaci, now the province of Monofaci, twelve grossi to Papas Constantinos, and one Hyperpera to the Church of Saint Veneranda in Calou for an image of her for her soul. Veneranda is the Italian name for Paraskevi. In addition to this uh, exceptional mention of an image of a saint, probably an icon, the donations are addressed indiscriminately to Latin and Greek priests, reflecting the possibility for Latin donors to address themselves indiscriminately to members of either religion, the proximity of the village church, probably taking precedence over other considerations. In an urban context, the dual presence of Greeks and Latins was also reflected in donations and the commission of art artworks. The Cretan dependency of the monastery of St. Catherine of Sinai is emblematic of this. One of the capital's most important religious buildings, the church, was chosen as a burial site by members of eminent Cretan families and received donations from members of both communities. Some of these bequests provide information about the cult of the monastery's titular saint. The will of the icon painter Angelos Arbandos, done up in 1436, evokes the bequest of an icon of St. Catherine to the monastery, while Cecilia, the widow of Antonio Apamo, uh, provides in her will of April 16, 1337, for a donation of 10 hyperparites to the bishop by roadside there and expresses the request that the lamp in front of the icon of St. Catherine be constantly supplied with oil so that it can be lit day and night. It's the same support, an icon of St. Catherine, seems therefore to lend itself to the devotion of Greeks and Latins alike. These double donations reflect the fluidity of the devotion to holy women, which, especially outside urban centers, seems to be adopted by Latins, regardless of the right of the church to which they donate. This may well be a reflection of everyday religious practices, where close ties with, with a priest or a parish, favored by the residents of the commissioners in rural areas, are more important than their belonging to a Venetian or Greek family. Icons commissioned by Latin women show an adoption of the Greek church's relationship to images that do not seem to contradict the prescriptions of the Catholic church. The information provided by the wills preserved in Venice even leads us to question the sharing of worship spaces, which seems to have been possible. The two donations to the church of St. Catherine of Sinai in Candia suggests that dual Latin and Greek attendance was hardly a problem although the do documents do not specify whether both rites were celebrated there. In any case, the requests for intercession made by Greeks and Latins to female saints provide a glimpse of the possibility of a shared interest in the, in the cult of saints, which until now had only been documented in Crete 
in a very specific civic context around the figure of St. Titus. Other Latin marks of appropriation in these churches can be found, such as graffiti, which bear witness to the continuity of the appreciation of the images of Greek saints by Latin travelers in the afterlife of the Byzantine churches of Crete. But that would take us far into the modern era and should be discussed another time. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Nicola, uh, for another fascinating uh, presentation of this uh, that concluded this session. Um, I think that now we can open the floor to discussion. We have some time to do that. Um, perhaps we can freely, uh, you can freely um, intervene on the four papers or or we can maybe begin with the first one. Um, you can either raise your virtual hand or um, even write in the chat, I think. And if there are questions from the audience in person in Venice, please do let me know. Um, so uh, there are questions for the first uh, paper um, by uh, Magdalena Gancharska on uh, Dionysius of Furna and others like um, Doxaras and Zefarovic, and um, who reminded us, uh, who, who provided us with this interesting um, overview of uh, literary um, sources, those that we use as sources, but we have to contextualize as we learned. Are there any questions for Magdalena? Vivia, we have uh, some of the most distinguished uh, specialists in uh, Byzantine and post-Byzantine art among us, uh, professors of the university. So probably they want to intervene or ask something. It would be, would be very valuable to have their opinions if they want. Yes. Um, ah, you mean me? <laughs> no. Hey, you and other scholars. From ah, yes, of course, of course. I I was waiting for people to break the the ice and uh, and ask something or give some comment. Um, well, I think that we can still think about that and maybe um, go back to, um, to this uh, paper later. Maybe um, we can go on for the moment and um, um, jump into the Italian Renaissance with the two uh, intriguing papers. The first one by um, Constantinos Gravanis. Uh, on um, Raphael's network in Greece. Are there any questions or comments? I was I was really impressed uh, about your um, overview of the possible connections of uh, of Raphael in Greece, which is we, there, there are actually it's it's a, it's a quite overlooked uh, topic when we think of Raphael and uh, the Italian Renaissance, but it's it's something that uh, needs to be highlighted and stressed. So thank you for that. Um, and um, I was wondering if I can start with a little question: if there might we might find any connection with um, the um, fluxus of, um, for example, manuscripts uh, from Greece to Italy uh, in, um, uh, in the early 16th century. Um, so that uh, if I was wondering if, if that might be also a channel for, um, for this. Well, for, 
First of all, thank you very much for your comments. Yeah, it is an under-researched area. It's also a fascinating area, especially now that our history is becoming more and more global. Uh, it's something definitely worth looking at. Uh, with regard to sources, documentary sources, as far as I know, um, there are a couple of sources related to the foundation of the Greek college in Rome in 1513. So we have some documents which report uh, um, the disciple of Janus Lascaris who went to these islands that I mentioned, Kithira, Crete, and especially Corfu to recruit gifted uh, Greek students from noble families. So I think there are one or two documents. So we know when that happened. And we know that some of these uh, students became later uh, eminent scholars. One of them, I don't remember his name, he uh, produced uh, an illustrative uh, translation of Homer's epics. But as far as I know, the documents are scarce, if any at all. I don't know, maybe someone else knows this better. Uh, I haven't conducted any archival research, to be honest, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I know it's a field that needs to be um, explored. Mm -hmm. Other comments or questions for, Constantino's uh, paper. If not, while you... Don't, if, if, yeah. if, if you excuse me, just a very quick yeah. comment. Uh, speaking of documents, uh, apart from manuscripts also, uh, we can speak of visual documents, uh, like drawings, like uh, engravings, prints after Raphael's designs. For, for example, it's not entirely related to my topic, but there has been some research done um, by some Greek scholars, including, I think, Professor Kostadudaki, I'm not so sure if she's in the panel, and people who have observed that Theophanes, the famous Greek painter from Crete, he knew uh, engravings. Uh, he knew he was aware of prints made after Raphael's designs, and we know this because his frescoes in Mount, on Mount Athos, uh, he has picked up at least two motives from Mark Antonio Raimondi's engravings after Raphael. So speaking of documents, it's not, not only manuscripts. We all hope to discover some great uh, document out of nowhere, but also we have many, we have a lot of graphic material, which I think waits for us in the archives and to make some interesting connections about these issues. Just was, that was just another thought of mine. Yes, sure. Um, not just in the archives. I was thinking of libraries and uh, illuminated manuscripts, or which were um, uh, Greek manuscripts, which were arriving to 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 Italy in that period. So I was wondering if there might have been a connection. You know, uh, I'm talking about the people who were involved in this kind of transmission. Mm -hmm. Other questions. Um, while maybe the audience still thinks about it, and um, we can we can maybe um, go um, on to Yanti Asimakopoulos' uh, paper, who is somehow related to the to the um, uh, context we just left, but uh, you know on a different perspective. Uh, thank you for showing us all the multiple layers that can uh, um, uh, be seen on, uh, on, on one single work. So you, you really dissected it, but contextualized it very well, I think, in the, in the um, uh, period and place where it was produced. Are there any questions for Dr. Asima Kopulu? Can I just make, sorry, one comment? It's not a question, just one comment. Uh, uh, congratulations to uh, uh, Iantia Smakopula. I found her paper fascinating and convincing. Just a comment, I think, as far as I know, we know that Julius II indeed wanted to uh, conceive Rome as a new Jerusalem. I think some sources speak of him fashioning or humanist glorifying him as a new Solomon or as a new Moses. So generally I found your interpretation uh, thorough and, and convincing. 
in relation also to this uh, comment, we know that some of the early drawings for the Massacre of the Innocents have uh, at least one figure that uh, is quite similar to uh, the scene of uh, Solomon uh, at the ceiling of the Stanza de la Signatura. So many scholars um, agree that uh, they should be at the same time, more or less. And that's why the date is around 15 or 10, uh, 11, 12. Thank you very much for uh, your comments. I have a curiosity, just really out of curiosity. How did this engraving arrive in Athens, the one you were studying? Do you know? Do you have any idea, or is I, it more I don't than have much? I don't have all the uh, details since it's a research that I, a research that I have uh, just uh, started. Um, we know that um, uh, many of the engravings were, were bought uh, the mid of um, last century uh, for the National Gallery. So um, it is connected to the uh, great interest to buy um, engravings by Dürer, Goya and others. Mm, so by that by the museum directly, not yeah. not okay. Interesting. That is also interesting, actually. Thank you. Um, other questions or comments for um, this paper or for the other ones? Of course, we can always go back. Um, If not, maybe we can move on to Nicolas Varenne's paper on representation of female saints and documents related to um, uh, patronage in, uh, in Venetian Crete. Again, we have experts on uh, Venetian Crete in the audience, so uh, I encourage to uh, ask questions or uh, express your comments to Nicolas paper. Thank you again for your um, interesting overview. Uh, again, this was, uh, I'm, I'm asking a question in the meanwhile that other colleagues think. Um, Perhaps I missed it again, so in this case, I apologize. Uh, the documents and wills you showed from which archive uh, did you, in which archive did you find them? Which, where? And all those documents are in the State Archive of Venice. Of oh, Venice, uh, But okay. they've all been uh, published mm -hmm. uh, in the 90s. I mean, most of them. Thank you. Please, other comments or questions? I don't know if from the audience in Venice, uh, there is some question or curiosity. Um, please let me know because I can't see you. There is no question, uh, Lydia. Uh, congratulations to all speakers for the fascinating papers. So um, I don't know if somebody from the audience, Professor Kostandudaki or Melita Emanuel or other scholars, distinguished scholars of iconography will, would like to make any comments on these papers. Um, so if not, uh, we, we will end our session and we will be back on uh, uh, five o'clock uh, in the afternoon, Venice time. Uh, but uh, if anyone wants to test his um, uh, PowerPoint, he can uh, remain with us and test his PowerPoint for the evening presentation. So if uh, there are any questions, we can uh, still uh, remain and wait. Thank you and congratulations uh, from me to, to the speakers. We have one question. 
Αγγελική στρατή. Λίβια. Um, yes. It's Αγγελική στρατή. Oh, oh, yes, sorry. Um, yes. Please. Doctor. Yes, I see the hand now, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Strati, would you like uh, to ask your question? So if not, uh, we can uh, ask uh, uh, Dr. Papakostas and Dr. Uh, Mrs. Verikoku to remain with us to make a test on their uh, devices and uh, PowerPoints. Yes, Livia, you, uh, please. Thank you very much for uh, being chair of this uh, session. Thank please. you, Livia. Thank you, Livia. Thank you, thank you all. Uh, Mr. Papakostas. Έλα Πασχάλη, εδώ είμαι. Καλημέρα. Ε, ε, καλημέρα Τάσο, τι κάνεις. Mm -hmm. Καλά, ε, καλά. Πολύ ενδιαφέροντα όσα ακούσαμε μέχρι τώρα. Αλλά αυτό το, η, η, η online παρουσίαση δύσκολα κάνει λιγάκι δύσκολο να με ερωτήσει και συζήτηση. Δεν είναι τόσο εύκολο όσο άμα είναι κάποιο εκεί. Τώρα μπορεί να, να ενθαρρυνθεί περισσότερο το ακροατήριο. Next time, next time θα κανονίσουμε yeah. αν είναι. Να κάνουμε κάτι. Mm. Ε, θέλεις να δοκιμάσεις το PowerPoint σου. Ναι. Ε, λοιπόν, πώς το κάνω. Το έχω εδώ ανοιχτό. Άμα πάω... Ε, άνοιξε το στην οθόνη. Ναι, και πάτα share screen πάνω το πράσινο κουμπάκι. Κάτω, κάτω μάλλον. Στην οθόνη. Α, ναι, να το εδώ. Share screen. Λοιπόν, εδώ το PowerPoint. Share. Τώρα φαντάζομαι... Make it, bigger, make it bigger εκεί πέρα που έχει κάτω ναι. μια μπάρα. Ναι, ναι, εκεί, εκεί λίγο πιο δεξιά. Τώρα το βλέπεις ολόκληρο ή όχι. Κάτσε, κάτσε να σου πω λίγο να κλείσουμε. Ε, ναι, το βλέπω ολόκληρο. Ε, ε, ολόκληρο δεν είναι, παιδιά. Έχει κάτω κάτι... Έχει, έχετε κάνει προεπισκόπηση. Ε, προβολή παρουσίαση. Ε... Προβολή παρουσίαση κάνε τάσο. Πάνω, πάνω ψηλά στην πάρα. Άμα, ε, εδώ φουλε, τώρα να το κλείσω και να το ξανακάνω. Λοιπόν, ναι, ναι, ναι. Πάω, πολύ παρουσίασης. Δηλαδή, το, το έχω επιλέξει αυτό. Slide show, slide show, δεν είναι παιδιά. Ναι, slide show, αυτό είναι που έκανα και προηγουμένως. Και ίσως επειδή έχω μισό λεπτάκι, έχω δύο οθόνες μπροστά μου, άμα να αποσυνδέσω τη μία, ναι, μήπως ναι. αυτό που το περδεύει. Okay, okay. Ε, τώρα κάνει κάποια διαφορά Όχι Όχι το ίδιο το δείχνει Λοιπόν περίμενε Ξανά να το ξανακάνω τώρα Τώρα ε, Τώρα είναι fine ε, τέλειο τέλειο Τώρα είναι εντάξει και να το δοκιμάσω Μισό λεπτά και να προχωρήσω Και μας και με πελάκια προχώρησε το ναι Τέλειο ναι. τέλειο μια χαρά είμαστε Οκ okay, ωραία Τώρα υλικό εντάξει σε ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ. Αναμένουμε, αναμένουμε. Να σου πω, η, το κοινό uh, λέξη... Κλείσε την παρουσίαση σου μόνο. Κλείσε την παρουσίαση για να μπορέσουμε να κάνουμε και καμιά δοκιμή άλλη. Ναι. Χρειαστεί. Τι να... θα ανθείς το κοινό λέξη θα γίνει άλλη ώρα ή πώς, πώς θα το, γίνει. Το, το, η Ανθή δυστυχώ έπρεπε να φύγει. Δηλαδή ήταν πολύ στενά τα όρια, αλλά είχε πρόβλημα με το κομπιούτερ της και έπρεπε να βρει ένα άλλο κομπιούτερ. Και μου έστειλε μήνυμα πρέπει να φύγω λέει για το αεροδρόμιο. Ήταν πολύ στο όριο δηλαδή για να προλάβει yeah. εκείνη την ώρα. Από τη στιγμή που δεν κατόρθωσε να συνδεθεί και δεν μπορούσαμε να περιμένουμε γιατί μπορεί να περιμέναμε πάρα πολύ. Ναι, ναι. Θα πω, θα το, μπορεί να το κάνει αύριο ή μεθαύριο ή δεν δε δε ξέρω. Θα δοκιμάσω να τις στείλω. Θα ήταν καλό να, αφού έχει κάνει και μια μονογραφία και είναι ειδική για τα θέματα αυτά. Ναι, ναι. Ε, okay. Είναι σημαντικό να την ακούσουμε, ναι. Εντάξει, ευχαριστούμε. Εντάξει, εγώ σε ευχαριστώ. Θα σου Έλα, okay, Μάρα, bye. καλημέρα. Bye. Καλημέρα, Καλη... Μακού. Ναι, μια χαρά, Μάρα, όλα καλά. Αχ, τι καλά, Πού γιατί δεν είναι. 
Ωραία. Να κάνω share Έλε, screen. κάνε, κάνε, κάνε και εσύ, ναι. Ωραία. Δώσ' το μου ένα λεπτοτάκι. Ε... Δώσ' μου ένα λεπτό. Πήγαινε εκεί, έτσι. Είναι ολόκληρο. Τέλειο, τέλειο, σούπερ. Είναι εντάξει. Ζηλεύω το υλικό, ζηλεύω. Είναι εντάξει γιατί δεν ακουγόμουν το πρωί. Μια χαρά είναι, σούπερ. Τέλειο oh, υλικό. Τέλειο. Για όλα. Εντάξει. Εντάξει, τέλειο. Σε ευχαριστώ πάρα πολύ, Πασχάλη. Τα λέμε το βράδυ. Καλή συνέχεια, καλή συνέχεια. Γεια, γεια. Να σας ρωτήσω κάτι. Ε, καλημέρα. Γεια σα.